questions. Everybody seems to have a question that they need answered in life. Hi, my name is Eric. In this next seminar, Dr. Hoven takes a large variety of questions that he's been asked on a regular basis and combines them and gives his best explanation for what's happening. He covers a variety of topics such as the Red Sea Crossing, Primitive Man, what about radiocarbon dating? Hey, are there really contradictions in the Bible? Find out for yourself in this seminar entitled, Questions and Answers. Welcome to our very informal question and answer session where we deal with questions that are not covered in our seminar on creation evolution. Uh, for those just getting this material, my name is Kent Hovind. I taught high school science for 15 years and now do seminars on creation and evolution. Since early 1989, I've been doing this. The Bible tells us in the book of Ecclesiastes, chapter 7, he said, I applied my heart to know and to seek and to, to search and to seek out wisdom and the reason of things. 1 Peter chapter 3 tells us that we should be ready always to give an answer to every man that asketh us a reason of the hope that's in us. I think it's good for Christians to study the truth so that they can give an answer to those that are not Christians. And it's good for those of you that are not Christians to study the truth so that you can become Christians. When you get to the top of the mountain of truth, you'll find the Christians were sitting there all along. Uh, God's word is truth. In 2 Timothy chapter 2, the Bible tells us we should study to show ourselves approved unto God, a workman needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. So, in this session, we're going to deal with quite a few miscellaneous questions. If you have questions that are not covered here or elsewhere in the seminar, feel free to send them in. We'll try to deal with them as time permits on our website, drdino.com, or on our radio program, or possibly in a future edition of our question-answer tapes. One question I often get when I say I believe in creation, they're going to say, oh, wait a minute, all scientists believe in evolution. Well, that's simply not true, okay? The vast majority of scientists may believe, or some the majority of scientists may believe in evolution, but it depends on what you mean by evolution. But all scientists do not believe in evolution. And even if they did, that's not how you determine truth. It is possible for the majority to be wrong. History shows us there are many times when the majority is wrong. The majority of scientists used to teach that all the planets go around the Earth. That is wrong, as far as we know. By the way, there's still some folks who believe in the geocentric theory. I don't fight them, I disagree with them, but. Uh, there are really some surprising number of folks who believe in the geocentric theory. But for years, many people thought, the majority of people taught, that the heavy objects fall faster than lighter objects. That was taught for 2,000 years, and it's wrong. It's not true. For many years, it was taught if you're sick, you have bad blood. Take out your blood, and you'll get better. That is simply wrong. It's not true. There were places all over the country to get your blood taken out. They had little white poles out front with a red stripe around it. The barber was the blood letter. So, even if a majority of scientists do believe something, that doesn't make it true. Let me give you an example here from the book of John, chapter 7. The people, therefore, were, they were arguing about Christ, and they said, when they heard this saying, said, of a truth, this is the prophet. Others said, this is the Christ. But some said, shall Christ come out of Galilee? Hath not the scripture said that Christ cometh of the seed of David, out of the town of Bethlehem, where David was? Here's the Hovind translation. They're arguing about the wrong subject. They were arguing, should Christ come out of Bethlehem or Galilee? And they thought Jesus came from Galilee, so he can't be the Christ. They didn't realize he came from Bethlehem. So he, he was the Christ, obviously. And he did come from Bethlehem, but he was raised in Galilee. In John chapter 7, it says, There was a division among the people because of him, and some of them would have taken him, but no man laid hold on him. What I get from this verse is, if you don't like somebody, if you don't like their message, kill the messenger. And this you see a lot in the creation evolution uh, arguments. If you watch some of my debates, I've had over 80 debates now at universities. Oftentimes they get so angry at me because of what I'm saying. Uh, I'm just delivering a message. I'm just telling you what the truth is from science and what God's Word says. Don't get angry at me. There are folks, there are over 500 anti hovind websites. They really don't like me. And they all want to get me into an email debate. And then they say, I won't debate them. I won't get an email debate them, but I'll debate them publicly anytime, anywhere. Um, I don't have time for an email debate. I type 12 words a minute with 19 mistakes. I simply don't have time, okay? We have to run a real busy ship around here. The next verse says, Then came the officers to the chief priests and Pharisees, and they said unto him, Why have you not brought him? Now get the picture here. The Pharisees sent, their office, sent the officers off to, catch, to get Jesus, and then they came back without him, and they said, Why didn't you get him? 
And the officers said, Never man spake like this man. Here's the Hovind translation. The professors sent their students off to ask the heretic questions, but they didn't, the professors didn't go themselves. I get this a lot. I'll speak at universities. The professor doesn't show up uh, to, answer que to ask questions, but he sends his students with a list of questions. And you'll see the student pull out a list of questions, and they're going to trip up Hovind on something, you know. So they ask me their questions, and I answer all of them. And then they go back and tell their professor, well, he answered all my questions. And the professor says, well, you should have asked him this and this and this. Well, you coward, you should have come yourself, professor. Don't send your students off to do your dirty work. If you've got a question, give me a call. What I also get from this verse is the Pharisees decided they're going to use the law. They're going to legally try to stop this guy from sharing this message. They wanted to shut Jesus up. And there are people who will use legal tactics to try to shut up the Christians. They try to exclude Christianity from public schools. They can't handle the message, so they shut down the message so people don't get a chance to hear it. And that's what I see in John chapter uh, 7. Then answered them, the Pharisees, are ye also deceived? The Pharisees are saying, are you stupid? Then they said, have any of the rulers or the Pharisees believed on him? Notice this, their evidence that Jesus could not be the Messiah was because they didn't believe he was the Messiah. Therefore, he can't be because we don't believe he is. You get the same kind of logic with some of these professors in colleges. They'll say, well, all scientists believe in evolution, therefore it must be true. <laughs> That's ridiculous, okay? They don't all believe in it, and even if they did, that doesn't make it true. You can see the same parallel 2,000 years ago in the book of John. Then the Pharisees said, this people who know not the law are cursed. Here's the Hovind translation of this verse. We have knowledge, you don't. We don't approve of your degree. You're ignorant if you don't believe in evolution. And you'll see this a lot in the creation evolution argument. They'll say, we're smart, everybody else is dumb. I get this a lot when I do debates. They'll say, well, the average person in the audience probably doesn't understand the complexity of this topic. And I'll say, folks, what he's trying to tell you is, you're dumb, he's smart. And that's precisely what they're trying to, trying to say in a subtle way. The next verse, verse 50 says, Nicodemus saith unto them, he that came to Jesus by night, doth our law judge any man before it hear him, and know what he doeth? They answered and said unto him, Art thou also of Galilee? Search and look, for out of Galilee ariseth no prophet. And every man went to his own house. Even some of the non-believers were smart enough to realize this guy's telling the truth. And we get people by the thousands that write our ministry or call us and say, Look, I was not a believer, but I saw your material on creation, and I'm convinced creation is true. And that's what we're trying to do. We want to convince you that God's word is true. The whole argument here in John 7 started with a false assumption that Jesus came out of Galilee. Okay, they're arguing about the wrong topic. The Pharisees didn't believe in him, so they said, that's proof he can't be the Christ because we don't believe him. If he was, we would believe in him. That's silly. That's the same thing you used to get today. Skeptics will say, well, has Hovind or any of these, have any of these creationists published in science journals? And when they say no, they'll say, see, that proves, that proves he can't be right. <laughs> that's their logic, okay? It doesn't take a few seconds to think how dumb that is. First place, creationist material is routinely excluded from, creation, from science journals. Because, from, I should say, science journals, because they've started with a definition that science cannot include the supernatural. Therefore, if your explanation isn't 100% natural, it's not science. Therefore, creation is by definition not science. That's their thinking. They don't realize evolution is not science. Evolution is based purely on the assumption that things happen. It's never observed or tested or demonstrated in the laboratory. It's purely religious. The majority can often be wrong. The majority followed Aaron in rebellion in Exodus chapter 32. The majority voted not to go into the Promised Land in Numbers chapter 32. The majority followed false gods many times throughout the Old Testament. Read to it and you'll see. The majority was wrong. The majority of religious leaders hated Jesus. The majority of the world hates Christians. So, it is not true that all Christians, all scientists believe in evolution. If it were, that wouldn't matter, okay? And you don't determine truth that way. But let me share with you a few Christians who are scientists, who are strong believers in creation, and who are also very brilliant scientists. Robert Gentry, a friend of mine from uh, Tennessee, is a brilliant scientist when it comes to radioactive material and the disposal of radioactive waste. He worked at Oak Ridge Laboratories. He published this book here, Creation's Tiny Mysteries. Excellent book about radio polonium halos. You can get it through our ministry in our bookstore or on our website. Robert Gentry was doing tremendous work. It was published in many major science journals about radio polonium halos being found in granites all over the world. I went and met with Robert Gentry, saw, his, saw the polonium halo through the microscope in his laboratory, and everybody was fine until they realized, wow, his research proves the Big Bang Theory is not true. And boy, they shut off his funding and his grant money in a hurry. He uh, finally uh, said, well, we don't, we don't have a job for you anymore. 
just because his research was supporting creation. Dr. Robert Gentry up in uh, Halo, at, go to www.halos.com and see for yourself. Dr. Uh, uh, sorry, Roger DeHart was a science teacher in, uh, near Seattle, Washington. He was told he could not inform his students of errors in the textbooks. Here they've got textbooks with mistakes in them, but he couldn't tell the students about the mistakes because if they, those mistakes were used to support the evolution theory. He said, they said you can't even pass out current science journals to inform students of mistakes in the textbooks. That's not science. That's that, uh, you know, burn the heretic attitude that some people get, or go burn the witch, you know. And there's, talk about a witch hunt. The evolutionists are on a witch hunt against the creationists in the public schools. They will try desperately to get them fired from their job. Kevin Haley was a biology teacher at Central Oregon Community College in Bend, Oregon. He lost his job simply because he was exposing errors in the textbooks. He'd say, kids, information on page 87 has been proven wrong. Disregard that. That won't be on the test. And he's right. It was proven wrong. I debated one professor one time, and I gave out like 20 or 30 lies in the textbooks. And he got up and said, now, folks, Hoven's right. All these things are not true. But he said, Hoven, I got a question. What are you going to replace all this with? <laughs> in other words, we can't take the lies out of the books until I find a replacement. In other words, I've got to provide evidence for his theory, or else we can't take the lies out of the books. Talk about dumb. Uh, that's not the way science works, okay? You teach the kids the truth. Just teach the truth, okay? And if all you have are lies to back up your theory, then get a new theory. In uh, Texas, Baylor University fired William Dembski just because he advocated that there might be an intelligent designer. Oh, that's heresy. There could be a designer. You're out of here. You're fired. Forrest Mims was a science writer for 20 years. He published in National Geographic, Science Digest, American Journal of Physics, over 60 magazines and newspapers. He was denied a job as science writer for Scientific American simply because he was a creationist. They didn't want to have a creationist on their staff. Teacher Rod Levesque was told he could not uh, share information that might help students doubt Darwin's theory. See, Darwin's theory is sacred. You don't question it without losing your job in many school systems. Okay? The same thing happened in Russia 10, 15 years ago. If a teacher got up in their class and said, kids, I don't believe communism works, <laughs> he'd be out of a job and maybe out of the country or out of this life. They'd kill him or send him off to Siberia. You get the same kind of academic Siberia, people sent off to academic Siberia, if they don't support the evolution theory right here in America, the land of the fee and the home of the slave. Mr. Uh, Eller told his teacher, Dan Clark, in Lafayette, Indiana, Mr. Eller was the uh, superintendent, that he could not introduce creationism to his class. So uh, Dan Clark resigned. He quit. Many good teachers are dropping out of the public school system because they're not allowed to teach kids the truth. The problem is not the law. The law says you can teach creation. Not a problem to teach creation legally. The courts have ruled it's okay to teach creation, but the boss says don't do it. The ACLU, which is the American Communist Lawyers Union, they learned years ago all they have to do is threaten to sue and the school will back down. Even though the ACLU knows they will lose the suit, doesn't matter, the threat of a suit is enough to make it the, teacher, the teachers get fired. Just the threat of a suit. And so that's what's happening. We're losing by default and not even putting up a good fight. Dean Kenyon was a professor at uh, San Francisco State University in San Francisco. He wrote uh, many books about evolution. He was the poster boy for the evolutionist. He was a strong believer in the theory. And one day he got converted and began to believe in creation. And they fired him. He sued. They put him back in as a lab assistant, you know, washing test tubes, which the students do normally. And here's a guy, 20-year, I believe, tenured professor. Finally, after a long battle, he was reinstated with his job. But if he hadn't been tenured, he wouldn't have kept his job. That's what happened to Dean Kenyon. He wrote the book Of Pandas and People, which you can get through our ministry. Uh, Dr. Denny at uh, Texas Tech University had on his website for years that if you wanted to get recommended for medical school, he's from Lubbock, Texas, that you had to confess to believing in evolution. If you don't believe in evolution, you, he's not going to recommend you for medical school. When I spoke in Lubbock, Texas in the fall of 2002, the students there got together and offered Denny $900 if he would debate me. He refused. He wouldn't debate for two hours for 900 bucks. I don't know how much he makes an hour, but I suspect it's not quite that much. So, Mr. Denny, I'll come anytime, anywhere, and take you on intellectually in a debate on creation evolution. Evolution is one of the dumbest ideas in the history of humanity, and the devil is laughing at you for believing in that silly theory. And it's, if you don't trust Christ, you're going to go to hell. I'm not your enemy. I'm your friend. I don't want to see you go to hell. I'd like to see you get converted. But what you're doing is unfair and certainly unwise and, I think, un-American to require a student to believe a certain religion and all you have is a religious worldview of evolution 
And you require students to believe that before you give them a recommendation letter. Come on, grow up, let kids learn the truth. We can go on and on how people are discriminated against by, because of their belief in creation. Uh, Patrick Henry College was notified they were going to deny their uh, recommendation uh, to be accredited simply because they didn't believe in evolution. We'll have lots of information on our website about how students or universities or teachers are discriminated against because of their belief in creation. Now, it wasn't always this way. If you go back in the past, 100 years ago, 200 years ago, all the scientists believed in creation. Here's a list of quite a few scientists, Francis Bacon, Johann Kepler, uh, Blaise Pascal, Robert Boyle, uh, Isaac Newton. These guys were the founders of major branches of science, Carolus Linnaeus, and they were creationists. George Cuvier, um, on and on the list goes of hundreds and hundreds, if not thousands, of very famous scientists who were creationists. Not always young earth creationists, but certainly creationists. And many were young earth creationists. Uh, Richard Owen, Louis Agassi, um, James Jewell. All you got to do is notice, folks, the many, nearly all branches of science are started by people who believed in creation, not people who believed in evolution. The evolutionists don't come up with anything. They don't create anything. They come in and take over an institution that's already going. And many Christian colleges have been taken over by evolutionists. Harvard, Princeton, and Yale started off as Christian schools. And now they've been taken over by those who believe in evolution. The evolutionists don't go start something. They just take over like a leech, you know, or a tick, or a parasite, what somebody else has already created. Uh, Werner von Braun, the space scientist, was a strong believer in creation. Um, there are many books out. There's a good book, In Six Days, 50, Why 50 Scientists Chose to Believe in Creation. There are quite a few books on this topic. You can see our website, drdino.com, and get more. Okay, next question. What about separation of church and state? Is it okay to discuss creation in public schools? Well, first place, the phrase separation of church and state is not found in the Constitution. Don't let somebody tell you that the, the law says it has to be a separation of church and state. That's baloney. That phrase was used by Thomas Jefferson in a letter that he wrote to some pastors in the Danbury Association, a Baptist association in Connecticut. He's the one that said, the First Amendment has erected a wall of separation between church and state. Thomas Jefferson said that. It's not in the Constitution. And by the way, if there's a wall between the two, it's a one-dimensional wall. It keeps the government out of the church. It, does not, it was not designed to keep the church out of the government. So there's no such thing as separation of church and state found in the Constitution. The fact of the matter is the Founding Fathers, when they gave the First Amendment, Article 1, the same day, I believe, voted to give, I think, seven or ten or fifteen thousand dollars, something, to a mission in uh, St. Louis to help some, a Catholic mission reach the Indians there with what they thought was the gospel. Um, so you just go through the history, go to wallbuilders.com, David Barton's excellent website, and get some of his material, and you can see how that the Founding Fathers were certainly strong believers in creation and had no intention of the government getting involved in the church, but they had every intention of the church getting involved in the government. And the idea of no Christianity in public schools would have been anathema to the Founding Fathers. They would have sent those guys off on a ship to some other country. Okay, next question. How do we see stars that are billions of light years away? I get this question every seminar I do, I believe. There's no question there's an awful lot of stars out there. The Bible says in Nehemiah chapter 9, Thou, even Thou art Lord alone. Thou hast made the heaven and the heaven of heavens. God created all the stars. And there's an awful lot of stars out there. It's interesting. Stars blow up every once in a while. They run out of fuel or whatever happens and they implode and then explode. It's called a nova, or if it's a big one, it's called a supernova. It seems that about every 30 years a star explodes. Well, after searching the heavens, they've only found 300 supernova rings. So the question would be, if the universe is millions of years old, why aren't there more supernova rings, the remnants of these blown up stars? That indicates only a few thousand years. Of course, the Bible says God made everything 6,000 years ago, and the textbooks say it's billions of years old. I think the textbooks have a problem, because there should be a lot more supernova rings. Plus, obviously, you have a problem. Stars being born should equal stars dying, or else you're going to have a real serious problem. There are plenty of stars out there, but we've never seen one star forming. We see stars blow up every 25 or 30 years. We've never proven the formation of one new star. One atheist I debated said, oh, Hovind, there's this new star forming right now in Crab Nebula and some of the different uh, clouds out there in space. You see stars forming. No, you don't. You see spots getting brighter. You are assuming a star is forming. But actually, all you're seeing is a spot getting brighter. It could be there's a dust cloud clearing and there was already a star behind it. Any fourth grader would know that. So nobody's ever proven the formation of one star. Uh, in Science Magazine in 86, they said, the silent embarrassment of modern astrophysics is that we do not know how even a single one of these stars managed to form. 
situation is no better now. There, nobody can prove any star formed by natural processes. If dust tries to get together, as it increases in density, it increases the temperature, which increases the m movement, and it drives it back away. It's called Boyle's gas laws. You cannot compress dust into um, solid matter without creating a real serious physical science problem of overcoming the gas laws. The pressure increases, the temperature increases, which drives them out again. It's not going to happen. One professor said, oh, Hovind, we figured if 20 stars explode near each other, they'll produce enough energy to squeeze the gas and make a new star. I said, well, sir, that's just brilliant. You know, you're saying if you lose 20, you can gain one. Man, you ought to run for Congress and help those guys borrow their way out of debt. You know, <laughs> that's a dumb idea. We've never seen it happen. It's purely theoretical that 20 stars could do that, but that is a losing proposition, not gaining. There are lots of stars. The Bible says God created the stars in Genesis 1:16. He created them to be lights on the earth. Psalm 147 says he counts the number of the stars and gives names to all of them. The Bible says he layeth the beam of his ch beams of his chambers in the waters, who maketh the clouds his chariot, who walketh upon the wings of the wind. It is possible that Psalm 104 ties in with Psalm 148, that there is still water above the heavens. Nobody knows what's beyond out you know, the stars, if there's an end at all. But it could be that this verse and uh, verse Revelation, where the Lord sits on many waters, is talking about the fact that there, is a, there was a layer of water above the earth, and there may be another layer of water beyond the stars. Don't know, just a theory, something to chew on. There's no way we can tell anyway. Okay, there's a lot of stars out there. It's been estimated that everybody on earth could own two, two trillion stars to yourself. That's a lot. Million, billion, trillion. The stars are really far away. Hubble telescope focused in on a dot. They thought they found a black spot in space about the size of a grain of sand held at arm's length. They looked at that spot for 10 days, and in that one spot, there were so many stars they'd never seen before that they couldn't even count them. That's just one spot, the size of a grain of sand, new stars just discovered. There's a lot of stars. Stephen Hawking, who, hate, who hates Christians and creationists, said, and won't debate me, by the way, Steve, I'll take you out any time. Uh, he said, stars are so far away, they appear to us to be just pinpoints of light. He said, there's only one feature we can observe, that is the color of their light. So when you look at a star, you cannot see the size or shape of the star. All you see is what color it is. We assume that stars are like the sun, and the sun is like stars, but that is purely an assumption. We don't know that. Some people say, oh, yeah, we can tell by the elements that it's burning. It seems, gives a color characteristic, you know, the signature, you can tell the elements. You know, evolutionists never talk about this, but they are, of course, assuming that even the molecules evolved in other places, just like they evolved on Earth. They're assuming the same 92 elements we have here would be the same found throughout the universe. They've never talked about that, but you have a real serious problem if you just assume that the same molecular arrangement evolved, because molecules would have to evolve too, by your theory, which I think is a dumb idea. Okay. I taught high school trig for many years, is one of the uh, subjects I taught. If you want to find the distance to an object you can't possibly touch, like a star, you have to measure it with what's called parallax trigonometry. You have to know two sides and one angle, or two angles and one side, in order to calculate the distance to this unknown point, or to this, this unknown distance to this point with simple sine, cosine, tangent. The problem is, Earth is only 8,000 miles in diameter, which is basically nothing compared to star distance. So to, to find the distance to a star, you have to get your observers further apart to make a triangle. That's you know a decent angle. Well, they look at the star in January. Then they look at the star in June, and they get a much bigger base on their triangle. This is Earth's orbit around the sun. Well, it's 93 million miles to the sun, which is a long ways, but it takes light eight minutes to get here from the sun. It's called one astronomical unit. That is, uh, the distance from the sun to the earth is an AU, an astronomical unit. So we are eight light minutes from the sun, which means the diameter of our orbit is 16 light minutes. That would be the diameter of Earth's orbit around the sun. This diagram here shows a little yellow dot on the far left. That would represent Earth's orbit, 16 light minutes. A year has 525,000 minutes in it. That's a real skinny triangle if you did it to scale. It's like having two surveyors with you know, a telescope 16 inches apart, looking at a dot 525,000 inches away, which is eight and a third miles. You set that up and draw it out on a piece of graph paper, you find you've got a real skinny triangle. It works out to be an angle of 0 0.017 degrees at the apex. I think you can have a hard time measuring something like that. If you want to measure 100 light years, by the way, that was just to measure one light year. If you wanted to measure 100 light years, you'd have to move your dot 830 miles away, keeping your surveyors 16 inches apart. 
That's like having two guys on my roof here in Pensacola, Florida, looking at a dot in Chicago. If the guys are 16 inches apart and they're focusing on a dot in Chicago, that's a real skinny triangle, okay? Figuring 15 billion light years is clearly impossible. It just can't be done. And I don't think you can tell exactly where you were six months ago on opposite sides of Earth's orbit. That would be a stretch also. Okay, this textbook says, Parallax trigonometry can be used to measure distances less than 100 light years. I agree, much less. I think you'd have a hard time measuring 20 light years, but I'll give them 100, I'll give them 500 for the sake of the argument. The fact is you can't measure a billion. I'm not saying the stars aren't that far away, they, they probably are. I'm just pointing out we have no way of measuring it. We don't know how far away they are. If somebody tells you that star is, you know, 7.9 billion light years away, just say, how did you measure it? Was it a Stanley, a Lefkin, or a Craftsman? And who held the other end of that tape measure? Because I want to meet this guy. It just can't be done. So number one, we cannot measure the distance to the stars. Number two, we don't know what light is. Is it a wave? Is it a photon? Is it a particle? Is, I mean, it behaves sometimes like waves, sometimes like energy. It, it, nobody knows for sure what light is. We know what it does, and we use it all the time, obviously. But nobody's ever defined what light is very clearly. So the entire principle or concept behind a black hole is the idea that light can be attracted by gravity. Well, if light can be attracted by gravity, if black holes exist, which nobody's proven that either, but then the speed of light can't be a constant. At Harvard University in 99, they slowed light down to 38 miles an hour. The next year, they slowed it down to one mile an hour in the year 2000. The next year, they brought it to a dead stop. They took light and absolutely stopped it. This was done at Harvard, it was done at Smithsonian, and it was done at Cambridge. And by the way, that's how science works. An experiment should be demonstrable, repeatable, testable. Evolution is none of those. Nobody's ever demonstrated or tested or proven any of it. It's all in the mind. They think it happened. It's not science. Okay. At Princeton University in the year 2000, they speeded light up to 300 times the speed of light. Why would the speed of light be an unbreakable barrier? Uh, Barry Setterfield, Australian astronomer, did a lot of work on the, the speed of light question. He says, the speed of light has decreased. He said, in the last 300 years, at least 164 measurements of the speed of light have been published, 16 different ways it was measured. He said, the speed of light has apparently decreased so rapidly that experimental error cannot explain it. Here's a chart showing that the speed of light has declined in the last 150 years. About 1960, the chart seems to level off, and everybody since about 1960 has gotten the same number. If you measure the speed of light today, you're probably going to get 186,282 point something miles per second. Okay. That could be because in the late 50s and early 60s, they began using the atomic clock to measure the speed of light. And the atomic clock uses the wavelength of a cesium-133 atom, which means you're using light to measure light. You have a rubber ruler. Of course, you're not going to see it if it's declining. It may be we're on the tail end of a logarithmic, logarithmic digression, or it simply may be we're using a rubber ruler by using this atomic clock to measure it. Here's a couple articles showing about how that the speed of light was apparently exceeded by a factor of as much as 100. Clear back in 88 and 95, there were articles published about this. The speed of light is not a constant. Um, the Radio Physical Research Institute in Russia, uh, the cosmologist there, said the speed of light was 10 billion times faster at time zero. Astrophysics and Space Science Magazine, 1987. According to the Big Bang Theory, the speed of light had to be much faster initially. Here's an article from 2001, uh, Science News, saying about the speed of light may have changed over history, study says. Um, Imperial College in London, the man wrote an article and said, a shocking possibility is that the speed of light might change in time during the life of the universe. At uh, Rutgers uh, News Service put on an article from Sydney about a team from Australia that said the speed of light may not be a constant in August of 2002 says the speed of light can change. The speed limit of the cosmos is being questioned. September 2002. So, there's a book out called Faster Than the Speed of Light. And I'm sure this fellow who wrote this book would be persecuted for daring to suggest such heresy as this. Discover Magazine uh, ran an article about this. Was Einstein wrong about the speed of light? A recent article saying Einstein was wrong. The speed of light is not a constant. So. I don't think we can prove what light is, and I don't think we can prove lights always travel the same speed. Number three, the creation was finished when God made it. It's interesting, Jesus made wine out of grapes that never existed. Turned water straight to wine. Where's the grape stage? 
he can make a full-grown man out of the dirt and then make a woman out of his rib and make animals out of the dirt. He can make the earth out of nothing. Jesus made enough to feed 5,000 people out of a little boy sack lunch. We're always trying to limit God. I get real worried about folks that try to put human limitations on God. Uh, God didn't make two babies and put them in the Garden of Eden and hand them a package of seeds and say, here, plant these quick. You're going to need supper. He made a full-grown man and a full-grown woman in a full-grown garden. That's the only way it's going to work. Number four, thing to consider. A light year is a distance. It's not a time. It's a distance. It's the distance light can travel in a year at today's speed. A light year could be done in one second if you speeded the light up. It's simply a distance. It's like so many gazillion miles. I think a six trillion miles is a light year. Okay, number five. Since the speed of light is not proven to be consistent, why would star distance have anything to do with age of the universe? Some people say, oh, wait a minute now. I know we can't measure the distance with uh, tri triangulation, parallax trigonometry. What about measuring with Cepheid variables or redshift? Well, that's the other way they try to do it, and also loaded with flaws in the theory there. The redshift is the idea that when light goes uh, from a star, the red is shifted over. They look at the light through a spectroscope, and you'll see black lines on there, and the black lines are shifted toward the red end of the spectrum. You get the normal spectrum, red, orange, yellow, green, blue, indigo, violet. But the black lines are shifted red. And they'll say, wow, this is proof the star is receding. It's, running, it's moving away from us. That could be. I don't know. But there might be other ways to answer this. This is called the Doppler effect. If a train is coming toward you, it squeezes the sound waves in as the train makes noise. And you'll hear, it drops pitch as it goes past you. It's called the Doppler effect. If you're going past the sound source or the sound source is going past you, either way, it works the same. Sound is it's called compressed coming in and refracted or stretched going out. Well, they thought possibly if the star is coming in, it would squeeze the light waves, whatever light waves are, and make a blue shift. If the star is leaving, it would make a red shift. And so when the red shift was discovered years ago, they looked around the heavens and found most of the stars are giving a red shift. And they said, wow, this proves they're leaving. No, it doesn't, but that was the assumption. And then they said, if all the stars are moving away, that proves there was a Big Bang. That was the evidence for the Big Bang Theory, <laughs> the red shift. Talk about a lack of logic, but uh, that's what they said. Okay. This fellow says, there was an early sign that red shifts reliably indicate the distance of galaxies. For quasars, however, the diagram shows a wide scatter in apparent brightness at every red shift. He said, in fact, there is little correlation of brightness to red shift at all. Either quasars come in an extremely wide range of intrinsic luminosities, as most people believe, or the redshifts do not indicate distance. Sky and Telescope, December 94. Um, same magazine said, uh, thus for the only conclusion that can be drawn is that at least some quasars are relatively nearby, and a large fraction of their redshift is due to something other than expansion of the universe. So if somebody tells you we know the distance to stars because of redshift, say, I'm sorry, that is simply not correct. We don't know the distance because of redshift. Get the book, The Evolution Cruncher, from our ministry. It's $5 for a 900-page book. Excellent book, loaded with stuff on creation evolution. He's got a whole section about the Doppler effect and the expanding universe. The Science News 95 said, Another set of observations indicates that the universe appears to be 8.4 to 10.6 billion years old. The new work relied on the Hubble Space Telescope to obtain, obtain distance to faraway galaxies. A team led by Tanver at the University of England used a two-step method to estimate the Hubble constant. I always get a kick out of that. Here they've got an equation which involves a number that you're going to multiply, like an algebraic equation, and they can change that number. They call it a constant, but they change it all the time. Okay? I taught algebra for years. I'm telling you, you change one letter in an equation or one value in an equation, you change the outcome. That's why they're always getting wild numbers for the age of the universe, because the Hubble constant is not a constant at all. Okay, let's go on here. He said, first they observed a type of standard candle, stars known as Cepheid variables, to find the distance to the spiral galaxy M96. He said, you have to be very careful about drawing conclusions because of the Hubble constant, because measurements have huge systematic errors. Astronomers believed the veil, one of the best studied supernova remnants, was 2,500 years, light years away and 18,000 years old. They were quite wrong. In fact, the veil is only 1,500 light years away and 5,000 years old, from Discover Magazine, January of 2001. An article about Rip Van Winkle showing stars are much younger than they thought. Um, the article, University Around Us at Cambridge University, said even the nearest Cephids are so remote, it's difficult to determine their absolute distance with any accuracy, any great accuracy. 
All large distances in astronomical literature are subject to an error of perhaps 10% from this cause alone. He said, we know that faintness, you know, how bright the star is, arises from two causes, distance and absorbing matter in space, and it's generally not possible to apportion it between the two. Get the book, The Evolution Cruncher, and find out what happened to Halt and Harp, who dared to question the redshift theory. Good way to lose your job. There's discrimination against those because they're looking for, looking for anything to hang on to this dumb Big Bang theory is the problem. Big Bang theory is a dud. Fred Hoyle said that 30 years ago, or 20 years ago. Okay, Isaiah 40 tells us the Lord sits on the circle of the earth, and it says he stretched out the heavens like a curtain. Isaiah 42 talks about the stretching of the heavens. Isaiah 45 says he stretched out the heavens. Jeremiah 10 says he stretched out the heavens. There are several theories of what's causing the red shift. One theory is the stretching from the creation. This is a normal thing you would expect because he stretched out the heavens like a curtain, just like the Bible told us. Maybe that's the only reason we have a red shift. Second theory is the light's getting tired, traveling great distance. Third theory is as it travels through whatever space is made up, maybe space is nothing, maybe space is something, we don't know what space is, but as the light travels, that may automatically be a phenomena that causes the red shift. It could be the Doppler effect, the star could be moving away, I don't know, and nobody knows, okay? It could be the light is being speeded up or slowed down as it goes past a dense gravitational mass in space. We simply don't know what's causing the red shift. Next question, I get to ask this question quite frequently, actually, is the sun shrinking? The sun is obviously burning, you can step outside and look at it in the daytime. The sun is losing about 5 million tons of mass every second. The sun is obviously burning and losing an enormous amount of fuel. So, if you go backwards in time and add 5 million tons per second to the sun, you start to create a problem at some point. I don't know what the number is, and I wouldn't give a number, because as soon as I give a number and say, X number of million years ago this would have happened, the atheist or the skeptic will pick on the number and miss the concept. The fact is the sun is burning. If the sun were larger, it would begin to suck Mercury and Venus in, first of all, Mercury first and then Venus, and then slowly affect Earth. Now, the Bulletin of American Astronomical Society in uh, 1979 said, Since 1836, more than 100 direct observers, different observers at the Royal Greenwich Observatory and the U.S. Naval Observatory have made direct visual measurements that suggest the sun's diameter is shrinking at the rate of about a tenth of a percent each century which works out to be five feet per hour. Now, whether the number's right, I don't know. But the fact is, it's pretty obvious the sun is burning, and the sun, for a hundred years of measurements, they said it's shrinking about five feet an hour. Of course, now the sun is gigantic, about 880,000 miles in diameter, so it's not a problem. We're not going to lose it anytime soon. Uh, Science Magazine ran an article in 1980 that said several d indirect techniques also confirm the sun is shrinking, although these inferred collapse are only about one-seventh as much. By that thinking, the sun would have been touching the earth uh, 158 million years ago. And again, I don't, that's not my number. Somebody else uh, came up with that as a possible calculation, that the sun would have been touching the earth. The fact is, the sun is shrinking. This chart shows the measurements of the, not only the polar diameter, but the equatorial diameter. The sun has uh, north and south pole like the earth does. Both measurements are diminishing in the last 160 years. It's been observed, the sun is shrinking. Now the sun oscillates, it swells and shrinks and swells and shrinks, but the overall trend is quite obviously toward shrinking. The sun is burning. That creates a problem. If you go backwards in time, the sun would be bigger and more massive, which is gonna upset the gravitational pull. So I don't think it's logical to say the Earth's been going around the sun for billions of years while the sun is constantly losing this mass and losing its gravitational pull. To me, that invokes the miracle. It's much simpler to say the system is not billions of years old like they're telling us. God created everything about 6,000 years ago exactly like the Bible says. Okay, what about carbon dating? Every seminar I do, somebody will say, wait a minute, carbon dating proves the Earth is millions of years old. Oh, no, it doesn't. The fossils are actually dated by their position in the geologic column. We cover that in seminar part four. And the geologic column does not exist any place in the world. Radiometric dating would not even be possible if the geologic column had not been erected first. Article in journal, uh, American Journal of Science magazine talked about this. Ever since William Smith at the beginning of the 19th century, fossils have been and still are the best and most accurate method of dating and correlating the rocks in which they occur. Apart from very modern examples, which really are archaeology, this guy said, I can think of no cases of radioactive decay being used to date fossils. So they don't date fossils by carbon dating or potassium argon dating. This is a mammoth tooth. They date them by the geologic column. They pick a spot and say, wow, that era was, you know, so many thousand years ago. 
and so this must be that old. Fossils are not dated by carbon dating. But let me explain how carbon dating works. The Earth's atmosphere is about 100 miles thick. On uh, this globe, it doesn't even show up. I mean, it's the thickness of the, of the paint, basically. 100 miles is not much. The space shuttle whizzes around just above the atmosphere, so it cuts down on drag, and they can get no friction up there. Uh, still get lousy gas mileage, though. The um, air, 100 miles thick, is mostly nitrogen. 78% uh, nitrogen, 21% oxygen, 0.06% carbon dioxide, and that's what plants breathe, CO2. Some people say 0 0.09 or 0 0.03, I don't know, it's, it varies, I'm sure, location to location. But there's not a lot of CO2 in the air. If you increase CO2, plants grow faster, which is a frustration for the environmentalist wackos when they burn forests, you know, all the CO2 is released and the trees next door grow faster. So it doesn't uh, create an environmental crisis like they want you to believe. Uh, there's extremely small quantities of radioactive carbon-14. The way this works, uh, radiation from the sun strikes the atmosphere, super high-speed energy comes down, bangs into the nitrogen, and changes it to carbon-14. Just a quick, simple chemistry lesson here. Carbon and nitrogen are right next to each other on the periodic table. Nitrogen is number 14, carbon is number 12. But if the nitrogen gets blasted by radiation, it turns into carbon-14. Normal carbon is called carbon-12. Here we have some what's called radioactive carbon, carbon-14. It's very rare, um, and it doesn't stay stable because it's always breaking apart. You can hear it with a Geiger counter. You know, in the movies, they got the Geiger counter getting by the uranium and going click, 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 click. Well, the same thing with carbon-14. It breaks apart. It's falling apart. And it's turning back into nitrogen and disappearing, which is a gas. It disappears into the air. Um, carbon-14 is produced in the atmosphere by the sun. It breaks down at the rate of about half of it will break down every 5,730 years. This is called the half-life. So if I give you a pile of carbon-14 and you waited 5,730 years, half of it would turn back to nitrogen and you'd end up with half a pile. If you wait another 5,700 years, half of that is going to turn to nitrogen. You end up with a fourth of a pile. In theory, it never goes to zero. It goes from half to fourth to eighth to sixteenth, etc. But plants are always breathing in carbon-14 in the photosynthesis process. They're breathing in carbon. Some of it's carbon-14. Most of it's normal carbon-12. Animals eat the plants and make it part of their body. Probably during your lifetime, you've either eaten plants or you've eaten animals that have eaten plants. That's about all there is to eat out there. And so you're absorbing radioactive carbon into you, just like I am into me, because we're getting it through the food chain. The plants got it from the air. The air got it from the sun. This carbon-14 got into the plants. Then it got into you or into the animals and then into you. But either way, we all contain some radioactive carbon. When the plant or animal dies, it's not going to get any more, obviously. So several assumptions are involved in carbon dating. First of all, they assume that the amount of C14 in the atmosphere, the ratio, which is a very small number, is the same found in the plants and animals. For instance, the atmosphere contains 0.0000765% radioactive carbon-14. It is assumed that I have the same. I've never been tested for C14, and I've never met anybody who has. But I would say that's a reasonable assumption, but it is an assumption. Okay. When the plant or animal dies, it doesn't get any more C14, so whatever it had begins to decay. It was decaying while it was alive, but you never noticed it because it's being replenished, so the balance would stay. But as soon as it dies, it begins to go out of balance. So basically, carbon dating is measuring the amount of carbon in the object with the amount of carbon in the atmosphere and getting a balance. If the atmosphere is 0.0000765% and the object you're dating is only half as much, they would assume it's been dead for one half-life. If it's only one-fourth as much, it's been dead for two half-lives, two times 5,730. And then it goes to a fourth, to an eighth, to a sixteenth. So they're comparing the amount in the object with the amount in the atmosphere. This is how carbon dating works. Sounds good, certainly sounds scientific, but it's based on some serious assumptions that mess up everything. It doesn't work. If I told you to fill a barrel with water, but I have drilled holes in the barrel, while you're putting water in, it begins to leak out. So you have a process of filling and a process of leaking at the same time. You have an adding and subtracting going on simultaneously. At some point, you're going to reach a stage called equilibrium. You'll never fill the barrel past that point unless you speed up the input or decrease the outgo one or the other. Well, Earth's atmosphere is constantly taking in carbon-14 from the sun, and it's constantly losing it to decay. So you have the same thing as the barrel. 
The question would be, how long would it take the Earth's atmosphere to reach equilibrium? Well, when carbon dating was first discovered or invented in the early 1950s or late 1940s, actually, Willard Libby did this, University of Chicago, he said, you know, I wonder how long it would take the Earth's atmosphere to reach equilibrium, because he knew about the equilibrium problem. They said, after doing some studies, it would take about 30,000 years. Basically, if you made a brand new planet Earth, poof, create one, cover it with air, start it spinning around itself and spinning around the sun, the sun is going to strike the oxygen, strike the atmosphere and produce carbon-14, and it's going to start decaying. And they said within 30,000 years, the atmosphere would be equalized. You'd reach this point called equilibrium. You're never going to get more C14, and you shouldn't get any less unless something changes in the system. Well, sounds good. I don't know if the number's right, but it's a, the concept is. Within 30,000 years, the Earth's atmosphere would reach equilibrium. The problem is, we still haven't reached equilibrium. There's more C14 now than there was 20 years ago. Actually, radiocarbon is forming 28 to 37 percent faster than it's decaying. So if we still haven't reached equilibrium, then the Earth is less than 30,000 years old, which is what the Christians have been saying all along. Uh, a friend of mine has a website, archie.org. You can get information there about uh, the Earth's atmosphere has still not reached equilibrium. There's been a lot of people doing research on this, and it just we're, we're not there yet. This chart indicates how carbon-14 is supposed to work in theory. An, an object that is still alive should be in balance with the atmosphere, which would give you 16, I'm going to simplify this a little bit, give you 16 clicks per minute per gram on your Geiger counter. If you're listening to a, you know, dating, a, testing a sample, it'll go click every four seconds, you know, click, click. If it's only giving you eight clicks per minute, then you're getting, you're assuming it's 5,700 years old. It's been through one half-life. If you're only getting four clicks per minute, it's been through two half-lives. If you're getting two clicks per minute, it's been through three half-lives. It's 11,000 years old. This is how carbon dating is done. If you test a sample and you find out you're getting, you know, two and a half clicks per minute or 2.9 or something like that, you look at the chart and read over and find the age by the simple calibration curve, they call it. Sounds good. Doesn't work. If you walked into a room and found a candle burning on a table, and I asked you the very simple question, when was it lit? You say, oh, I don't know, it was burning when I got here. Okay, let's do what's called empirical science, things we can test and demonstrate and weigh and prove, okay? We're going to measure the candle. We measure the height of the candle, we find out the candle is seven inches tall. Okay, when was it lit? You say, oh, I don't know. Okay, let's do some more science. Let's measure how fast it burns. Suppose we get an Olympic stopwatch and we measure this thing very carefully and find out the candle is burning one inch every hour. Now we've got two hard science empirical facts. The candle is seven inches tall. It is burning an inch an hour. When was it lit? You still can't tell me unless you make some assumptions. How tall was it? And has it always burned at the same rate? Neither of those assumptions can be proven. They are purely assumptions, okay? If you find a fossil in the dirt, all you know is it died. You don't even know where it died. You just know where it ended up buried, that's all. Now, the amount of carbon-14 could be measured very precisely, and the rate of, de of decay could be determined. But when did it live? I have no idea, and nobody does. Because you'd have to know how much was in it when it was alive, which that would depend on the assumption that the Earth's atmosphere has reached equilibrium, and we haven't. And you'd have to know that it's always decayed at the same rate. Now, if the Bible is right, and the earth had a canopy of water overhead, like the Bible, I think, clearly teaches in 2 Peter 3 and in Genesis 1, 6, and 7, this canopy of water would filter out quite a bit of radiation, and they probably had a lot less carbon-14 in the original creation than we do today. So, if you dig up a fossil from an animal that drowned in the flood, and I don't know if any of these are or not, but if you find a fossil and say, well, I believe this one, uh, this ammonite, may have drowned in the flood probably did. And we want to find and find out it's got carbon. It probably doesn't. It's been totally replaced by minerals, but let's assume it it's, 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 has an organic material. And so we carbon date it. They would assume that it lived in an atmosphere that just like we have today. Meh, faulty assumption. Not a good idea. There's some examples of how carbon dating doesn't work. We'll go in chronological order here. Back in 1949, an article came out in Natural History magazine it said the lower leg of a mammoth dated 15,000 years old, but the skin dated 21,000 years old. It didn't work in 1949. 1963, a living mollusk shell carbon dated at 2,300 years old. 
Well, here we are 14 years later, carbon dating is still not working. Okay? Uh, 1970, this article came out and they said, if a carbon date supports our theories, we put it in the main text. If it is not entirely contradicting, we put it in a footnote. If it's completely out of date, we just drop it. 1971, a freshly killed seal carbon dated at 1300 years old. Still not working, folks. Okay? 1975, a baby mammoth was found frozen. Part of it dated 40,000 years old, another part was 26,000 years old, and the wood next to it is 9,000 years old. Still not working in 1975. 1981, they tried it again. This guy said, no matter how useful it is, the radiocarbon method is still not capable of yielding accurate and reliable results. There are gross discrepancies, the chronology is uneven and relative, and the accepted dates are actually selected dates. This whole blessed thing is nothing but 13th century alchemy. It all depends upon which funny paper you read. Still not working. 1984, shells from living snails were carbon dated at 27,000 years old. Still not working. 1985, they took 11 human skeletons, the earliest known human remains in the Western Hemisphere, and they were carbon dated, or dated by accelerator mass spectrometer, all 11 dated 5,000 radiocarbon years or less. Here, these things are supposed to be, you know, a quarter million years old or something. It's not working in 1985. 1992, two Colorado Creek mammoths, side by side, buried frozen mammoths, were dated. One was 22,000 years old, the other is 16,000 years old. Still not working in 92. In 1996, at uh, Berkeley University, they've got the Geochronology Center. Carl Swisher used the most advanced techniques to date human fossils. This article said last spring he was reevaluating Homo erectus skulls found in Java by testing the sediment found with them. A hominid species assumed to be an ancestor of Homo sapien, erectus was thought to have vanished a quarter million years ago. Even though he used two different dating methods, Swisher kept making the same startling find. The bones were 53,000 at most and possibly no more than 27,000. Well, I would like to point out, Your Honor, that is a 96% error. So it's not working in 1996 either. Um, it's not logical to say carbon dating works. One part of a mammoth dated 29,000 years old, another part was 44,000 years old. This article said, in the last two years, an absolute date has been obtained for the Gandong beds. It has the very interesting value of 300,000 years, plus or minus 300,000 years. So it doesn't work. We have in our library the Geological Survey Professional paper, 862. Some skeptics on the web have argued that you know, I didn't understand what the paper was saying. I think I do. It shows the charts here of the different carbon dates they got from different animals and different you know, organic material found all over Alaska, the Geological Survey paper. Sample number 454, carbon dated at 17,210 years old. Sample 455 gave a carbon date of 24,000 years old. People say, see, what's the big deal? Well, look at it. This is the same sample as 454. 455 and 454 are the same creature. They're getting different ages. Sample 299 was dated at less than 20,000 years old. Sample 137X was dated at greater than 28,000. But read it carefully. That's the same sample as 299. They gave it a different number at a different laboratory, but it's the same sample. Two different numbers, same sample. Living penguins date 8,000 years old. Dinosaur, material from dinosaur bone layers were found and dated at 34,000 years old. They find organic material with dinosaurs, sometimes frozen dinosaur bones, sometimes unfossilized dinosaur bones are found. Um, two Russian scientists dated dinosaur bones at less than 30,000 years old. Hugh Miller in Columbus, Ohio had four dinosaur bone samples carbon dated. They told him they were 20,000 years old. He didn't tell them they were dinosaur bones. If he would have said, this is a dinosaur bone and I want you to carbon date it, they would have said, oh, we can't date that because it's too old. See, they start with, this is a dinosaur bone, by the way, it's been replaced by minerals. But they start with the assumption that dinosaurs lived 70 million years ago. If I took this to a laboratory and said, would you please date this, they would say, oh, well, we'd have to use something other than carbon dating because this is too old for carbon dating. They've already decided what range it fits in. That's not how science ought to work. You ought to be able to say, well, uh, let's just be open-minded about this. They can date the same sample 10 ways and get 10 different numbers. Okay? Here's the things to consider about carbon dating. If you date a sample of known age, I mean, you know how old it is, like the, uh, 
a tree ring. Carbon dating doesn't work. If you did a sample of unknown age, it's assumed to work. It's not science, that's not common sense. As elements decay, they produce helium. One of the byproducts of carbon decay or radioactive decay of any kind is it produces helium gas, which, you know, if, unless you're in the ground where it can be trapped in a cave, it's going to escape into the atmosphere. The helium in the atmosphere indicates the Earth is not billions of years old, actually less than two million years old, just based on the helium content in the atmosphere. If radioactive decay has been going on for millions of years, there should be a lot more helium. Taking all factors into account, the helium escape mechanisms and everything, it just, it, it's not more than two million years old. It's an excellent book if you want to get more in the go down deep stuff on carbon dating. You can get it through our bookstore if you want or call icr.org. They have the book there. This guy said the rocks date the fossils, but the fossils date the rocks more accurately. But I'll tell you what, folks, the cheese done fell out of his sandwich, all right? He said they use circu it's circularity is inherent in the derivation of time scales. They use circular reasoning. Uh, specimen uh, 10017 from the moon was dated six, divided into six pieces and dated many times. The ages ranged from 2.5 to 4.6 billion. Notice that's nearly a 500% error. It doesn't work. I talked to a J.P. Dawson in Oklahoma. He was the chief of engineering and operations for the Lunar and Earth Science Division at uh, NASA in Houston. He said they worked on the lunar samples, including the Genesis rock. He told me they found ages from 10,000 years to several billion years in the same rock. So basically, you can kind of pick what you want. There's an excellent chapter in this book uh, called Bones of Contention. The last chapter deals with what's called the dating game. It's hilarious to see how they change the dates uh, to make them fit. You know, if any new evidence comes in, we'll just change the date and make it fit the theory. All right, we'll take a little break here, come back and talk about the other dating methods, potassium argon, some of the other ones, and then go on to more of your questions. Okay, let's take a few more questions and answers. People often ask me about the age of the Earth and say, doesn't potassium argon dating prove the Earth is millions or billions of years old? Well, potassium is one of the elements in the periodic table. It slowly decays and turns to argon, which is a gas. So the theory is that when a volcano erupts, it melts the rock and turns to lava and comes out and spreads down the hillside, and the gas would escape because it is now a liquid. And so as potassium slowly decays to argon, which is a gas, if it melts the rock, it should reset the clock to zero. And so they think we can tell how old lava flows are, or ash flows, ash beds, because there should be no argon in them. It should reset the clock. It should be just potassium. Well, it sounds good in theory, but in practice, when you actually test it, it doesn't work, okay? It's true that potassium decays to argon. It has a half-life of about uh, 1.3 billion years. It very, very slowly decays. Of course, nobody watched it for 1.3 billion years. They watched it for three or four days in the laboratory and estimated how long it would take for half of it to disappear. But let's assume the half-life is right, and that would be quite an assumption, but I, I don't argue that much with them. The fact is, when you actually test it, like the lava flows that were tested from New Zealand, but this chart shows from the a radioactive dating failure here article about potassium argon uh, dates were given for a 1975 eruption at the very bottom of the list here, February 19th, and yet it was uh, way off. It was one to two, or a quarter of a million years old, and yet it was only 1975. 1949, a lava flow, they knew it erupted 1949, yet it gave, gave an age of uh, a little less than a quarter million years old. So it just simply doesn't work. Um, as much as 80% of the potassium in a small sample in an iron meteorite can be removed in distilled water in four and a half hours. So we don't know that it actually resets the clock. This Canadian Journal of uh, Earth Science article said, in conventional dating for potassium argon, it's common to discard ages which are substantially too high or too low compared with the rest of the group or with other available data, such as the geologic time scale. Oh, now here the truth comes out. Things are really dated by the geologic chart, not by just, you know, potassium argon dating. We've been through that before. In uh, Nature magazine, back in April of 1970, they had gave another example where they had dated a, a layer of ash called the KBS Tuff, named after K. Brenzenmeyer. This layer of ash was dated at between 212 and 230 million years old. I mean, for years, everybody had dated this layer of ash, and everybody agreed it's 200, you know, over 200 million years old. What they'll do is, if you look at the picture here, they will have different layers of ash that they will f assign dates to. These are from volcanic eruptions, lava flows, or ash layers. 
If you find a fossil between two layers, you can guess how old it was based upon the potassium argon date of the one above and the date of the one below. Sounds good. Doesn't work. Uh, they bracket the sample by the, uh, what's called an event horizon is the term they use for it. They'll say, well, there's a volcanic eruption and made this layer of ash over the whole countryside. Any fossils found below that layer have to be older. Any fossils found above this layer have to be younger. Sounds good. And uh, until Richard Leakey found a skull called the uh, KNMER for, uh, the, they give all these give them numbers, KNMER 1470. This skull was found under the KBS tuff. Now here everybody had been saying the KBS tuff was over 200 million years old and they find a normal human skull under it. Ooh, now you got a problem. So they redated this, the ash layers, the KBS tuff. They would, they would never have done, redated it if it hadn't found that skull. They redated the ash layers and took 10 samples and got numbers from 0.5 million to 2.64 million. Well, first I'd like to point out that's way down from 212 and still that's a 500% error. It doesn't work. I mean, a 500% error, they'd laugh at you if you put this in a court of law. It's interesting to look at the, the inflation of the age of the Earth. Back in 1770, George Buffon said the Earth is 70,000 years old. In 1905, the textbooks would say the Earth is 2 billion years old. In 1969, when they went to the moon, they said the moon and the Earth are 3.5 billion years old. And this number was arrived at by potassium argon dating, like this article says here. Today, the students are taught it's 4.6 billion years old. It's interesting. Do you know the Earth is getting older at the rate of 21 million years per year? That's uh, 40 years per minute. We're aging rapidly, folks, so it just, it's silly. Here's the things to consider about potassium argon, or any dating method for that matter. Number one, wild dates are frequently obtained. They're not always consistent. They get all kinds of numbers. They pick the ones that they want based on the preconceived idea, which is based, based on the geologic column, which is dumb. Secondly, dates that don't fit the theory are routinely rejected. Uh, that's not how science ought to work. I mean, it ought, if it works, it ought to work every time. If it ought to be testable or demonstrable. Uh, number three, it's obvious any dating method is based on the assumptions that the original content can be known, that the decay rate never changes, that the sample's never been contaminated. And the fourth observation somebody needs to point out to these guys is all of these decay rates are based on a decline, downhill slide, not uphill. Potassium decays to argon. Uh, Carbon-14 decays. Uh, everything is decaying. This is the opposite of evolution. They need something that's improving. This will go back to the concept we talk about on seminar part four of the six different meanings of the word evolution. You have to have chemical evolution where the chemicals go higher on the periodic table, not lower. All of these are examples of them going lower. Mount St. Helens erupted. Many volcanoes erupt. For instance, Mount Etna erupted in Sicily back in uh, 122 BC. It was a dated eruption. They had historical evidence for it. When the potassium argon dated it, it was a quarter million years old. The 1801 Hawaiian lava flow gave a potassium argon age of 1.6 million. It didn't work. Another Hawaiian lava flow from 1959 gave an age of 8.5 million years old. Mount Etna from Sicily erupted again in 1964. It dated, and everybody watched it happen. And if they, when they dated it with potassium argon dating, it was 700,000 years old. In 1972, it erupted again, and now the dates came three and a half million, three and a half, 350,000 years old. The lava from Mount St. Helens was tested right after it erupted, 1980. Brand new lava dome, they knew the age of it, and yet it gave numbers from different dating methods ranging from 350,000 to 2.8 million. This is coming from the same rocks, from the lava flow that they knew is 20 years old. So. Again, when you date a sample of known age, it doesn't work. When you date a sample of unknown age, it is assumed to work. That's not common sense. And again, wild dates are picked. They find them all the time. They pick the numbers they want. They reject anything they don't like. It's based on many assumptions, just like any other dating method is. Okay, get the book, The Evolution Cruncher, if you want a whole lot more on the other dating methods about uranium-235, uranium-238. There's much information there or on the website icr.org, which is an institute for creation research. Next question. Have fresh dinosaur bones been found? Absolutely, yes. Quite a few, actually. Uh, some frozen dinosaur bones were found in the book here, The Great Alaskan Dinosaur Adventure from Master Books in Arkansas. You can read about growing up and finding frozen dinosaur bones. In 1993, the Journal of Science, uh, December 24th, Christmas Eve, they reported an amazing preservation of the bones of a young duckbill dinosaur found in Montana. Under the microscope, the fine structure of the bones was seen to have been preserved to such an extent that the cell characteristics could be compared with cells of chicken bone. 
1961, in northwest Alaska, they found a bed of dinosaur bones that were unpermineralized. That means not fossilized. That is from uh, Journal of Paleontology, uh, 1986-87. Um, in Omni Magazine, January of 90, 1990, they talk about on the banks of the river in uh, Prudhoe Bay, Alaska, frozen dinosaur bones were found that are as light as balsa wood and look as fresh as yesterday's dog bones. The structure was porous and the fossils were not mineralized. On Bylot Island, 1987, they found the lower jaw of a duckbill dinosaur that was in fresh condition. Joe Taylor, who does a lot of digging for dinosaurs in Texas, in uh, Crosby, Texas, outside of Lubbock, has discovered many times, he said he finds dinosaur bones that are not fossilized. So the idea that dinosaurs lived millions of years ago is, is silly. Um, so, next question. If there really was a flood, where are all the human bones? People say, oh, if the world was totally destroyed, they ought to find millions of human fossils. Well, for about 4,000 human remains have been found, according to Marvin Lubinow, who's one of the smartest guys I know on the topic of... Uh, uh, human ancestors, you know, his book Bones of Contention is excellent from a Christian perspective on uh, all the so-called cavemen that they're finding. Many of the f human remains, even those are very fragmentary, just one bone or just a few bones, but let's assume 4,000 human remains have been found, just to pick a number. I think when God made the earth uh, 6,000 years ago, it was full of plants, full of animals, and only two people. 4,400 years later, when the flood came, 1,600 years later when the flood came, the world is still full of plants and still full of animals and still not full of people. I'm not sure what the population was. I would pick a number clear out of the clear blue sky and say, let's assume there was a billion people at the time of the flood. Could may have been a lot more. If they had 100 kids per family, populations grow quickly like that. But let's say, that, uh, let's say it was a population of a billion. Uh, it may have been 10 billion. I don't think there's any way to tell. Okay. Problem is, they all died except for Noah and his family. So. 1,600 years and 1,650 years after the creation, you still don't have the world full of people yet. The purpose of the flood was to destroy man off the earth, Genesis chapter 6 and verse 7. The Bible also says there were giants in the earth in those days, men of renown, mighty men, big people. Here's a, a picture we use on a seminar part uh, 2 about the human thumb bone on top compared with a giant human thumb bone underneath, found right near Mount Ararat. Here's the reasons I would give why so few human fossils have been found. Number one, there were less animals to be killed, less people to be killed than there were animals. Okay, so you're more likely to find animal bones than human bones, simply because there were, there were more of them. Okay, God only made two people, but he made a world full of animals. Secondly, people are smarter than animals. Uh, well, some people anyway. And so they would tend to avoid drowning until last, and they end up on top. So they end up rotting instead of being buried. In order to fossilize, the animal has to be buried. So I think you're more likely to find animal fossils than human fossils for this reason also. Thirdly, if humans were bigger, the bones might not be recognized as human. Because many people go into this study with a preconceived idea that evolution is true and man used to be small and we're getting bigger and better and stronger and smarter and probably exactly the opposite is true. If people were 8 or 9 or 10 feet tall before the flood and you found, dinos or you found human bones from somebody 8 or 9 or 10 feet tall like this, thigh bone here over my head, which is from a human that would have been nearly 13 feet tall. We cover that on uh, video number three, about the, or video two, I guess, about the giant people. That would have been a 13-foot human. Well, if, if just a fragment of that bone was found, nobody would dream it came from a human, if they believed in evolution, because they've got stuck in their head, man used to be like a chimpanzee, you know, three feet tall, and now we're six feet tall. And so they would, they would assign it to something else. They would call it a cave bear or a giant sloth or something. Okay, it can't be human. That they would know for sure. So I think many bones are misidentified for that reason because of the preconceived evolutionary uh, concept, which is a great hindrance to scientific research. Next question. Where did Noah get pitch? In my uh, debate number seven uh, with an atheist that uh, was a former preacher, a Church of Christ preacher turned atheist, he said Noah couldn't make pitch because pitch is made from oil and oil formed during the flood. Well, there's a problem with that, <laughs> several problems with that. <laughs> Genesis chapter 6, God said to Noah uh, to make the ark with gopher wood and pitch it with pitch within and without. Obviously, he's going to pitch it uh, before the flood comes, so he's not going to make it out of oil that are made from creatures that drowned in the flood. Exodus 2 talks about uh, Pharaoh's daughter drawing Moses from a, uh, a basket that was daubed with pitch. They covered it with pitch. Well, what is pitch anyway? Isaiah 34 talks about pitch. It says burning pitch, and it puts off a smoke. Here we learn a few things about pitch. 
If you get a dictionary from 1828, Webster's Dictionary, 1828, you'll notice you can look up the word pitch. And by the way, 1828 is before oil was used commercially, I think the first oil well was drilled in Pennsylvania about 1830s or 40s, maybe, I don't know, remember the date. But certainly there were no oil wells that we know of before that. So they weren't drilling into the ground to get oil, and yet they were making pitch in 1828. It's in the dictionary. It says, pitch is a thick, tenacious substance, the juice of a species of pine or fir. It's made from pine trees. It's the juice, the sap of a tree. It's, uh, second definition says, it's the resin of pine or turpentine, it's used in caulking ships and paying the sides and bottom. That's to waterproof the boats. So they were, used, they were pitch industries. They were whole factories. They produced pitch. They put it in barrels, and they would sell it to ship-making companies who would cover their... It's basically like a tar substance, but it's made from the sap of trees. So no, don't tell me the Bible's wrong because it says they used pitch before the flood. The Bible is absolutely correct, and the skeptics are wrong. Okay, next question. Was ancient man primitive? Some people get this false idea that modern man is smart and everybody in the past was dumb. <laughs> That's <clears throat> ridiculous. There's a lot of indication ancient man was extremely smart. There's an excellent book we sell called The Puzzle of Ancient Man by Don Chittick. Highly recommend this one. It's about 10 bucks, Showing some of the incredible achievements of ancient man. Before the flood came, the Bible says the people lived to be over 900 years old. You could learn a lot in 900 years. Plus, when you consider a couple other factors, they lived in a perfect environment. They would have had much higher IQs much uh, less to do as far as just daily things you have to do just to live. Most of those things are taken care of in a Garden of Eden. Don't need a house, you got perfect weather. So they can devote all their time to uh, study or learning things. Plus Adam came pre-programmed from the hand of God, probably had an incredibly high IQ. And he got to walk and talk with God for a while till he sinned, maybe a hundred years, we don't know. But uh, got to walk and talk with God. The other factor to consider is Adam lived long enough to know his great, 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 great grandson. Noah's daddy could have known Adam for 56 years. So you get not only a much greater starting, uh, a much higher starting point, they already knew a lot because God pre-programmed it into Adam. Plus they lived a long time and could learn a lot more. Plus they lived long enough to pass this on to many generations. Today an awful lot of knowledge goes to the grave. You know, about the time you know it all, you're, you die. Uh, or by the time you know a bunch of stuff, you die. Imagine if guys like Einstein could live, you know, eight or nine hundred years. How much could they, how much knowledge could they accumulate in a brain like that? So, I think before the flood they were much smarter, much smarter than we are today. And some of this knowledge uh, was passed down, and as lifespans got shorter it began to be lost. And a lot of societies were arranged to try to, uh, secret societies to preserve this knowledge, you know, uh, through different cultures and things like that. But they opened up a grave in South America. The grave was probably made about a thousand years ago. Uh, uh, and found a, this little uh, gold artifact in there. You can see it next to the dime for scale. Little uh, looks like an airplane about this big. The Smithsonian has it, and they have it labeled as a stylized insect. Because they got this preconceived idea, ancient man was dumb, modern man is smart, they could not possibly have known about airplanes a thousand years ago. And yet, here they've got one. That's not a stylized insect. I'm sorry, they knew about flight. An Egyptian tomb was opened as 2,100 years old, and it also had an airplane in it, a little model glider. How did they know about airplanes over 2,000 years ago? This iron pot found in a lump of coal indicates a high level of technology before coal formed. I believe coal formed in the flood in the days of Noah, so an iron pot is not a problem. The Bible says Tubalcane was an artificer in brass and iron. Some of the walls that are found in Peru of these giant stone walls have these massive blocks of stone that are cut and they fit together perfectly. One of the stones in one of these walls weighs 20,000 tons. Well, the biggest crane on earth today <clears throat> can only lift 3,000 tons. How on earth were they lifting a stone 20,000 tons? We simply don't know how they did it. Actually, in the book uh, Secret of the Lost Races, the author said, What's truly really impossible about the block is that it's the size of a five-story house and weighs an estimated 20,000 tons. He said, we have no combination of machinery today that could dislodge such a weight, let alone move it any distance. It shows their mastery of a technology that we, as yet, have not attained. Somebody in the past knew something we can't even do today, and I think that's the case with a lot of things. This brass uh, bell type thing was found Inside a lump of coal, Mr. Newton Anderson has it sitting on his desk. I've talked to him many times about it. I think you ought to donate it to our museum here, Mr. Anderson. We'd keep it safe for you, I'm sure. 
but kids could come by and see it here. We'd love to have that. By the way, if you have any artifacts for our museum, we'd, we'd love to get anything. We want to influence people for the Lord. So if it's sitting in your closet gathering dust, you can put it on a loan or give it to us or we'll buy it off you if we can afford it. So that's the kind of things we have here. We want to get the gospel out. This uh, vase found in solid rock, supposed to be 600,000 years old. Ancient man was 600 million years old. Ancient man was not primitive. They found a sunken ship in the Aegean Sea, which is near Greece in the Mediterranean. And there was uh, encrusted on there what appeared to be an analog computing device. The more they analyze this thing, it's now in the National Science Foundation uh, Museum, I believe, in, uh, I don't remember where that one's at, but I read about it a little bit. This uh, looks like an analog computer. This is uh, 2,100 years ago. This hammer was found in uh, rock supposed to be 400 million years old by a lady in Texas. Battelle Laboratory said it's 96.6% iron, 2.6% chlorine, 0.74% sulfur. No carbon. And yet it is stainless steel. It won't, it won't, rot. It won't rust. Carl Baugh's got it in his museum down in Glen Rose, Texas. Apparently they knew about electricity a long time ago because this battery uh, was found in Iraq from about uh, 2,000 years ago. The Egyptians must have known about electricity. This hieroglyphic shows what appears to be wires and a generator or something hooked up to these uh, two snakes. Either the snakes are producing the electricity or they're putting the electricity into the snakes. I don't know, but they must have known about uh, electricity a long time ago. They certainly knew about tampering with the skull, about brain surgery. Some of the skulls are found with holes that actually healed up. They did brain surgery and the people lived. One of the Ica stones from Peru shows a man doing brain surgery. Only about 25 of these stones in America. We have three here in our museum. This is one of the actual Ica stones from Peru showing a man and dinosaur together. Some of the stones show uh, amputations, uh, people's legs being amputated and artificial limbs being attached. They show heart surgery. Here are some of the tools that they use for the surgery, for the brain surgery. Uh, Dennis Swift has th spent a fortune and a lot of time studying all about the uh, Ica stones. They knew about reshaping the skulls. Here are some strange shaped skulls that they used uh, to, d d for whatever reason, they would uh, shape the skulls. Ancient man was not primitive. He knew an awful lot, probably more than we do today in many areas. Here's a stone from Ica, Peru, showing what appears to be heart surgery. They're taking the person's heart out. Now, whether that's the soul leaving and the guy died, or I don't know, but they, did, they knew about open heart. Here's one showing an artificial limb, thus amputation. This little thing appears to be designed to be a steam engine. Dennis Swift has a lot of information about that. They knew about the wheel a long time ago. This is from the Ica civilization, many, many thousand, several thousand years ago. This little spider in real life is only an eighth of an inch long. But this is one of the drawings called the Nazca Lines. Notice the leg on the right, the bottom right, has one leg that's much longer than the rest. It looks like, oops, they made a mistake. It was just discovered recently that this little tiny spider, which you cannot see without a magnifying glass, during mating season, just for a few seconds, that leg grows longer. It mates off the, the sperm and eggs are on the tip of that leg, and then the leg shrinks back in. How could they have known that without magnification? These uh, metallic spheres found in South Africa have parallel lines going around them, obviously man-made, and yet they're in rocks supposed to be pre-Cambrian. The textbook said it's 2.8 billion years old. <laughs> well, that's baloney. We'll have a whole bunch about this on our website. You can get it from Michael Cremo's books. And of course, he believes it's 2.8 billion. He's wrong about that, but he's right. It's a man-made artifact. Um, <clears throat> this mortar and pestle were found. Underneath deposits of rock, supposed to be three, 33 to 55 million years old, under Table Mountain in California. These uh, little, what they're called nano artifacts, were found, extremely tiny little uh, coils, some down to one ten thousandth of an inch. How did they carve something like that? How did they make something? How could they see something like that? <clears throat> I suspect they had much better vision, down to extremely uh, fine vision, to be able to see real tiny things, or they certainly knew about magnification techniques. These nano artifacts follow what's called the golden mean ratio. We're going to do a whole videotape on the golden mean ratio. That is absolutely amazing how that the Greeks discovered that, that the thing that's pleasing to the eye is rectangles that are 1 to 1.61 in ratio. 
That's what the pentagram is all about. And Donald Duck and Mickey Mouse did a cartoon, or Walt Disney did a cartoon about the golden mean ratio called Mathmagic Land, I think is the name of it. That's amazing, showing how the golden mean ratio is found in all sorts of things. It's found in the uh, chambered nautilus, the way that it grows, the length to width of the chambered nautilus follows the golden mean ratio. If you take one and cut it in half, I've got uh, one here. You can see the chambers inside as it grows. The, the ram's horn does the same thing. A sunflower does the same thing. Even the, the scales on a pine cone follow the golden mean ratio. We'll do a whole videotape on that someday. That's amazing. Okay, next topic. What about the Great Pyramid? The Great Pyramid is amazing. It is the largest building by far on the surface of the planet. Nobody knows for sure when it was built. There's a lot of theories about it. It's uh, much larger in volume than the Sears Tower. There are four theories about the Great Pyramid. Two theories say it's built before the flood. Two theories say it's built after the flood. And then they divide up into two theories say it's built by heathen people. It's just a heathen structure. No big deal. Other people think, no, it's a godly structure and it has symbolism in there for Christianity or for at least for the Lord. I don't know. It doesn't matter to me. I'll just show you the four theories with you. The Great Pyramid is a massive building. It is built in Egypt. It may be a fulfillment of this prophecy in Isaiah chapter 19. It says, In that day there would be an altar to the Lord in the midst of the land of Egypt and a pillar at the border thereof. And it shall be a sign and a witness for the Lord. Uh, many people have preached on this. Whether it's true or not, I don't know. But Egypt, they say, this pyramid is on the border where the kingdom split and there were two kingdoms feuding. So it's at the border of Egypt, but it's also in the midst thereof once the kingdoms got back together. Don't know. Couldn't prove that. The Great Pyramid, here's a schematic drawing of it, showing if you walk in the entrance on the right where the letter, letter A is, you can take the broad way that leads down to the pit, or you can go to the narrow way which leads you into the king's chamber. So here you have the symbolism of the broad way and the narrow way. If you go up the narrow way, you end up into a large section called the Great Grand Gallery, and there are markings along the wall that some people think are actually based on pyramid inches, which actually tells some kind of history of the world. You know, it's got events that came, correspond to major events in world history. It's the largest building by far. <clears throat> it contains enough stone to build a brick wall 10 feet high, completely around Texas. Some of the stones in the Great Pyramid weigh 70 tons. The top is 450 feet high. The cap capstone was never installed. The entrance goes down the broad way, or you can turn around and change your direction and go up the narrow way to the king's chamber. In the king's chamber, there's an empty tomb. Apparently, the tests have revealed there's never been a person buried in there. Again, it may be Christian symbolism. I don't know. The pyramid probably was originally covered with 144,000 casing stones that fit together so tightly that you couldn't even find the seams in many cases, and you definitely couldn't put a piece of paper between them. The capstone was never found. Revelation 7 tells us, there's going to be 144,000 of the children of Israel that are sealed in the book of Revelation. Interesting. 144,000 sealed stones encased the Great Pyramid. So this may be something, Christian symbolism, I don't know. Ephesians talks about the whole body being fitly joined together. Um, Matthew tells about the stone that the builders rejected became the head of the corner. Same thing in Mark chapter 12. The stone which the builders rejected, Luke 20, the stone the builders rejected has become the head of the corner. It could be that the pyramid, if it, if it is a Christian symbol, uh, has the ch cap a capstone, the chief cornerstone, not installed because God is telling us he's not done doing his work here yet. Don't know. Preacher's good. Maybe true. I wouldn't be dogmatic on it. But the book of Daniel talks about the stone cut out of the mountain without hands. It smote the image on the feet, and it became a great kingdom. Some people think that the, the New Jerusalem, which is 1500 by 1500 by 1500, is actually a pyramid. Because that's the only building that has one cornerstone, as opposed to a, normal buildings which have, would have four cornerstones. A pyramid would have one, and if Jesus is the light of the world, he could be the cornerstone that hasn't been installed yet. And he's going to be the ruler of the world coming soon to a city near you. Of course, Satan has uh, abused this uh, and used the Great Pyramid as the symbol on the back of the $1 bill. It's a symbol for the New World Order. Notice on the $1 bill they show the left eye, uh, which is what is often used in Satan worship. And they have a gap between the eye and the pyramid. This is supposed to be symbolic of the idea that uh, Lucifer has not been installed as the world ruler yet. They're hoping, of course, to get Lucifer installed. And in front it says, uh, Norvus Odo Seclorum, New World Order, New Order of the Ages. This is the symbol for the New World Order. has been on our dollar bill since 1935. 
In front, there are things growing in the back. It's desert. How that they're going to bring in their new world order. The 13 lines of stone on the Great Pyramid here apparently represent the 13 degrees of the Masonic Lodge. And that's all ties in. We cover more on that on video number five. Okay, next question. <clears throat> was the Earth ever a hot molten mass? Textbooks will say, as the Earth formed, the surface was similar to the moon. Craters like in the picture and large plains of volcanic basalt may have marked its surface. But unlike the moon, Earth's surface was hot and there were large pools of bubbling lava. That's what the books are teaching the kids in school. The question is, is it true? Well, Genesis 1 tells us God moved upon the face of the waters. When God made the earth, it was under water, which means it was not a hot molten mass. Somebody is wrong. So the question is, was the earth hot or was it not hot? Well, let's look at the scientific evidence. Robert Gentry from uh, Knoxville, or Powell, Tennessee, near Knoxville, has done great research on radio polonium halos. His website is halos.com if you want to get a hold of Robert Gentry. I've been to his house and in his laboratory. It's amazing. The stuff he did on radio polonium halos. He discovered in granites all over the world, there are little tiny rings. You can't see them without a good microscope. But these rings are sort of like, a best, the best analogy would be, if a hand grenade exploded in jello, all the fragments would fly out and be stuck in the, in the jello. If you had a big block of jello, it would make a halo. Well, as polonium decays, it's radioactive. As it decays, it sends off these little particles, and they all go a certain distance. So you end up, just similar to the hand grenade, you end up with a ring of these little particles. If this happens in hot molten rock, it's going to decay, make its little halo, and the halo is going to melt. It's going to disappear. Just like when fireworks go off, it makes a beautiful circle in the sky, and then it doesn't stay there. Of course, it, it falls down. Polonium has a very short half-life, and so if it made its little halo as the polonium decayed and made its little halo in the rock, if the rock was hot, the halo would disappear. If the rock were already cold, it would leave a ring behind. And these rings are found in rock all over the world. And Robert Gentry did a lot of research on this and said, folks, these rocks were never a hot molten mass because this is polonium that is original. It's not a daughter product or something else. And it's leaving a ring behind. This rock was never hot. And as soon as his research, people began to realize his research goes against the Big Bang Theory, they, he lost his funding, of course. Okay, next question. What about global warming? Is it true the Earth is heating up and we've got to save the environment and, you know, save Mother Earth and kill all the whales, or kill all the babies and save all the whales? Well, there's a good book, several good books about, about uh, uh, global warming. I think there's a whole lot more to this story than we realize. There's no question man has abused the environment, okay, but I don't think the government's the one to fix it. Um, there's a book called Facts Not Fear. You can get to Derry Brownfield's ministry in uh, Missouri. Radio uh, R12, which is what's used in refrigerants for air conditioners, it sinks. It doesn't rise. Try it. If you can get some R12 and poke a little hole in the can and put a match under it, it'll put the match out as it flows over it. It's not going up. Um, a volcano can produce thousands of times more ozone-destroying material than man has produced in the history of our, of our, of our modern world, okay, since R12 has been used for refrigerants. What's happened now, we've got a different one. I think it's R132 used in air conditioners, and the cost has gone way up. This is part of the plan to bankrupt the world, I think, you know, get everybody in debt to the New World Order folks. So, no, I, it's silly what's happened with air conditioning and, uh, and environmental uh, scares that are going around. I think the real purpose of the environmental movement is to abolish private property, which is Karl Marx's first plank on the Communist Manifesto. They want you to have to get a permit to cut down a tree on your own property. And that's another long, interesting uh, question about permits. We cover that a lot more on our uh, college class, CSE 104, I believe, of our college classes we offer here through our ministry. Next question. Doesn't the Green River Formation prove the Earth is millions of years old? Uh, no, it doesn't. The Green River in uh, northwestern United States has a lot of layers of rock around it. This is called the Green River Formation. If you take two pieces of glass with different colored sand in between, like you can buy at the mall, and you flip it over, it automatically sorts into many different layers. If you only have two densities of, of sand in there, the black and the white are two different densities, why does it make hundreds of layers? Well, you can take rock from the Green River Formation, which has millions of layers, grind it up to powder, sprinkle it in moving water, and it'll sort into hundreds of layers again. Here you have only two densities, and yet it makes hundreds of layers. So it's not proof these layers are annual deposits or anything else. It's proof there was moving water. 
Actually, when they drill into this rock in the Green River Formation, they find what's called an event horizon, a layer of ash. Sometimes between two event horizons, they find a number of layers, and they go over and drill again, and they find up to 30% difference, 35% different number of layers. It can't be annual layers. Okay, the Green River does not prove the Earth is millions of years old. Next question. What about the Mars rock? This article says, are we really Martians? Can't believe they cut down a tree to print that in a newspaper. <laughs> anyway, the Mars lander on uh, the lunar, landed on and tested Martian soil. The sophisticated equipment did not even find a trace of a germ, according to NASA. This is the rock that became the big uh, news article years ago. This rock was in a closet in, uh, NASA had found. It, somebody had found it near the South Pole, and they said it might be a meteor from Mars. This little bitty line right there was what this stir was all about. They said, wow, this might prove there was bacteria or life on Mars. Well, the problem is Mars is a long ways from the Earth, okay? The closest it ever gets is about uh, 50 million miles. That's the closest it gets. If you shrank the Earth and Mars down and made them a couple of tomatoes to get the right scale here, Earth would be a 4-inch tomato and Mars would be a 2-inch tomato. The closest they get at that scale is about a third of a mile apart going around the sun. The idea that something hit Mars and knocked a chunk off and it flew all the way to Earth and landed is silly. Chances of that is real close to zero. Okay? Here's some facts to consider about the Mars rock. Number one, they claim it came from Mars. We don't know that. Number two, they claim it broke off 16 million years ago and landed 13,000 years ago. What did this bacteria eat? How did it survive the impact? How did it survive the vacuum of space? How did it survive the entry, the, the re-entry, where it would have certainly burned? the freezing for 13,000 years. A NASA-funded team did the research, and the NASA grant money was stalled in Congress at the time this was going on. NASA had to find something to make themselves look useful, and so they called up this Mars rock, and the grant money was immediately released as soon as the Mars rock finding was announced. And then shortly thereafter, they had said, oops, it's not really a bacteria. This is a normal carbonate crystal that forms. It's a simple geologic process. It's not a, not a life at all. But they kept the grant money, of course. <clears throat> so that was the real purpose of it. The Bible says Eve is the mother of all living. I do not think there's life on any other planets except Earth. I couldn't prove that, but anybody who thinks there is is arguing from the negative position. Nobody has seen any life anywhere else. We know of eight other planets here in our solar system. There's no life on those. So I think we're it, folks. This is it. God did this just for us. Next question. What about theistic evolution? Couldn't God use evolution to get us here? I was in a debate one time, and afterwards this man came up to me and he said, Boy, you don't give much room to us folks who believe God used evolution, do you? I said, No, sir, don't give you any room at all. I think you got a retarded God. So if somebody says, Could God use evolution? I say, Well, that depends on what you mean by God. It's certainly not the God of the Bible. Um, <clears throat> the God that would use evolution or need to use evolution is cruel, he's wasteful, he's stupid, and he's deceitful. He's not the God of the Bible. It's not the character of God to use misfits and blind chance and death. My God gets it right first time. Jacques Monod, a Nobel Prize winner, said, Natural selection is the blindest, most cruel way of evolving new species and more and more complex and refined organisms. He said, The struggle for life and elimination of the weakest is a horrible process against which our whole modern ethics revolts. An ideal society is a non-selective society. One where the weak is protected, which is exactly the reverse of the so-called natural law. He said, I'm surprised that a Christian would defend the idea that this is the process which God more or less set up to have evolution. I agree, Jacques. Christians ought to be ashamed of themselves if they're saying God used evolution to get us here. That's a cruel God. Uh, David Hall says, whatever the God of implied by evolutionary theory and the data of natural history may be, he is not the Protestant God of waste not, want not. He's also not a loving God who cares about his productions. He's not even the awful God portrayed in the book of Job. The God of Galapagos is careless, wasteful, indifferent, almost diabolical. He is certainly not the sort of God to whom anyone would be inclined to pray. I agree. It's not the God of the Bible. Darwin's philosophy of evolution is summed up here in his book. He said, from the war of nature, from famine and death, the most exalted object we are capable of conceiving namely the production of higher animals, directly follows. 
Darwin thought that war, suffering, famine, and death was a wonderful process because that's how we get evolution. Well, Darwin's right. If his theory was right, that's how it would work. It's, he's wrong. It didn't happen. And that's not the way God would do it. My Bible says God's work is perfect. He does it right. The God that would use this evolution is wasteful. He's deceitful. The clear evidence shows there was a creation. A very wise creator designed this place. So, I would say this is not the God of the Bible. It's not uh, the kind of God you'd want to worship. God makes things perfect. He said he told it by his word. He made it in six days. Exodus chapter 20. And he rested on the seventh day. The Bible clearly teaches six-day creation, one day of rest. And Hebrews tells us his, his work was finished from the foundation of the world. He was done. He's not letting things evolve slowly. He finished it in six days, and he rested on the seventh day, Hebrews chapter 4. It says he ended his work <clears throat> in Genesis chapter 2. He ended his work on the seventh day. It's over with. It's done. It's not ongoing. There is no evolution happening today at all. Romans chapter 5 tells us that death came because of man's sin. 1 Corinthians 15 says man brought death into the world. Genesis 1 says God made man in his image. Any other teaching besides that is heresy. So if someone wants to teach, you know, that God used evolution, they're a heretic, according to Scripture. They're not teaching what the Scripture clearly teaches. Lastly, that's a retarded God. If he has to use evolution, it means he doesn't know what he wants. He's just playing around blind chance. It's not the God of the Bible. So, and that would nullify the need for the death of Christ. And there's no evidence for evolution anyway. So why would we take a perfectly good Bible, which has never been proven wrong, and try to compromise it with a dumb theory that's never been proven right? There is no evidence for evolution. So stick with the Bible. The Bible's absolutely correct as it's written. Some people say, doesn't evolution theory match what the Bible teaches? It's exactly the opposite. The Bible says man brought death into the world. Evolution says death brought man into the world. The Bible has the earth coming before the sun. Evolution has the sun coming before the earth. The Bible has oceans developing before the land, yet the evolution has the land coming before the oceans. The Bible has light before the sun. Evolution has sun before the light. The Bible has land plants first. Evolution has marine life first. The Bible has fruit trees coming before the fish. Evolution has fish coming before fruit trees. The Bible has fish before insects. Evolution is backwards. The Bible has plants before the sun. Evolution is backwards. The Bible has marine mammals before land mammals. Evolution is backwards. The Bible has birds before reptiles. Atmosphere between two layers of water. And evolution has atmosphere above the water. No, I'm sorry. The Bible does not match evolution. They are polar opposites. Somebody is wrong, and I happen to know who it is. The Bible is right. In 1828, Webster's Dictionary defined heresy as something that is an error or of opinion respecting some fundamental doctrine. The standard of scriptures was the standard of faith. Any opinion that is repugnant to, doc to its doctrines is heresy. And the Bible clearly teaches God made the world in six days. Anything other than that is heresy, according to scripture. Someone who's a heretic is a person who teaches a heresy. And so those people teaching this, in my humble, unbiased opinion, are heretics. All right. Here we have a picture of ham, ribs, chicken, and turkey. All of these have several things in common. All of them have some good meat, and each of them has bones. You have to learn early in life to eat the meat and spit out the bones, or you're going to choke on something. So just because somebody's a heretic in one area doesn't mean you can't learn something from their material anyway. I read stuff by people I disagree with on some things. I think they're wrong, but hey, they've got good things in some areas. I think Hugh Ross, what he teaches is he's got some good material in some areas, but I think he's a heretic in some other areas. He's teaching things that I think are clearly heresy. We have a debate with Hugh Ross on videotape. You can get our whole series if you'd like to get that. Okay, next question. What about these other religions out there? How do we know who's right? Well, this would take hours. We're not going to produce a whole videotape on that yet, but someday we will. You know, which religion is right? The Bible warned us, though, to be careful about being carried about with every wind of doctrine. And he that cometh and is, is, free, is first in his own cause, seemeth just. The first person that comes along says, oh, he's got a good answer there. But his neighbor cometh and searcheth him out, it says in Proverbs 18. So some ideas, some religious ideas, sound great the first time you hear them, but then you've got to really search it out, study the scriptures like the Bereans, and say, oh, wait a minute, that's not correct. Genesis 27 shows how Jacob told his father, he said, I'm Esau, and he brought him some uh, venison. It wasn't venison, it was, it was uh, lamb meat that he brought him, but... 
Jacob was tricked. I'm sorry, uh, his father Isaac was tricked. He couldn't see he was blind, but he felt the wool on the back of his hands and the back of his neck. He got the wool pulled over his eyes, is where the expression comes from. He was tricked precisely because he went by the feelings instead of by the written, by the word, by the voice. And I think a lot of churches today, people get tricked because they go by feelings instead of by the word. They'll say, well, I just feel like God is in this. Well, now, what's the Bible say? Oh, I don't know what the Bible says, but I just feel like he's in this. Just be real cautious if you're in a church that emphasizes feelings above the word of God. You can feel great by taking drugs, they tell me. I don't know, I've never done it. But that doesn't mean it's right, okay? It doesn't mean it's of God. If you don't trust feelings. Airplane pilots will tell you, you can fly into a cloud and you'll feel like you're going straight when actually you're falling and don't even know it because you can lose all sense of direction in a cloud. I've experienced that myself, flying into clouds. So don't go by feelings, you go by the word. Genesis 27 is a good chapter to see how he was tricked by the feeling instead of going by the word. Next question. They'll say, well, didn't the Pope accept evolution? Yes, he did. Many times they've admitted that evolution is the way God did it. That's what the Catholic's official doctrine is. This article from 96 says, Pope accepts evolution and creates furor. This Catholic nun and scientist and educator says that spirituality and science mesh. She said, uh, the people who believe in this creation myth, which is unscientific and not in the Bible, despite what they say, haven't really studied theology and don't know that the Bible is not a scientific work. This is heresy. She needs to get saved or get right with God, and it's not true that the Bible and science have a conflict. It's true that the Bible and evolution have a conflict, but evolution isn't science. Basically, now I love the Catholics and want to win them to the Lord, but the Catholic Church has a long history of teaching things that are just simply silly. Back uh, under Pope John the 22nd, back in the 12 and 1300s, they had a list of things you could, you could pay in order to sin ahead of time. It was an indulgence. For $2.25, you could rob a church. For two seventy five, dollars you could burn a house. If you killed a layman, it cost you $1.75. If you did forgery and lying, it cost two bucks. If you eat meat and lent, it cost you two seventy five. dollars If you ravis a virgin, that cost you two bucks. If you strike a priest, that's two seventy five. dollars Now, robbery is $3. A priest keeping a mistress costs two twenty five. dollars Procuring an abortion was $1.50. Murdering of parents or wife is $2.50. You can be absolved of all crimes for 12 bucks. Augustine declared prostitution was a necessary evil, and soon thereafter the church had 100,000 prostitutes employed by the Catholic Church. I love Catholics. I hate what they teach in many areas. They need to get right with God. Here's a picture of a pope kissing the Koran. We could spend hours talking about the Islam and the other religions, uh, we have a great book we sell in our bookstore called The Prophet by Jack Chick's ministry. Uh, you can get it uh, the, about the history of how the Catholic Church was involved in the creation of Islam in order to try to get the Holy Land back. It backfired on them, and now we have these two religions, uh, Islam and Catholicism. But actually, Catholicism started the Church of Islam. We could spend hours on that one. Next question. What do Muslims believe? They'll say, people say, isn't the Allah the same as the God of the Bible? Uh, no, absolutely not. Allah is a false god and is not the god of the Bible. Again, get the book The Prophet if you want to get more on that. Muslims knew Muhammad was a prophet because he had a mole on his back. That was the sign he was a prophet. He had a mole. Holy moly. Where did we get something like that anyway? The Quran says, when he, this man, I can't pronounce his name, reached the setting of the sun, he found that it set in a pond of murky water. The Quran teaches the sun goes down and sets in a pond of water. This is scientifically inaccurate, okay? That's not what happens. The Quran is loaded with things that are scientifically and spiritually false, inaccurate, they're wrong. The Quran commands, Allah said, any person who leaves Islam or encourages others to do so should be seized and slain. Allah told Muhammad that all those who opposed his message should be killed or they should be nailed to a tree with their, and their, or their hands and legs should be cut off. Uh, the Quran teaches when you meet or fight those who disbelieve, strike at their necks till when you have killed and wounded many of them. You're supposed to kill the heretics if they don't believe in, in the Quran and Allah. There's a great book called Who Is This Allah by Moshe. We sell it in our bookstore. The, they say, the Quran says, the last hour will not come before the Muslims fight the Jews and the Muslims kill them. The Adu uh, Harari the prophet said, Allah created Adam, making him 60 cubits tall. That's 90 feet. The 
third serve, verse 105 and 106, says, In the great and final day of redemption, only white faces will be saved, all blackened faces will be condemned. This is what they teach, okay? They say, Men, marry as many women as you like, one, two, three, or four. Under Islam, you can have up to four wives at a time, uh, and if you want to have temporary marriages, you can get married for 15 minutes. That's pornography is what it is, okay? It's perverted. Uh, the Hadith uh, here teaches that Satan stays in the upper part of the nose all night. That's the booger man. He said you have to uh, perform ablution. You have to wash out your nose three times in the morning with water because the devil spends the night in the interior of the nose. That's what they teach. Uh, the one apostle said, People should avoid lifting their eyes toward the sky while supplicating in prayer. Otherwise, their eyes would be snatched away. One guy reported that Allah's messenger told him uh, that none, the non-Muslim eats in seven intestines while the Muslim has one. So if you're not a Muslim, you have seven intestines. <laughs> this is silly. Okay, it's not true. Don Boyce has an excellent book called America's Trojan Horse about Islam and what a dangerous religion this is. Now, look, I'm not anti-Muslim for the people. I'm anti what they teach. I'm for truth. I'm against error. Even if it's my own mother. If she's 99% right and 1% wrong, I'll praise her for the 99 and say, Mom, you're wrong on the 1. So I'm not anti, I'm not anti anybody. I'm anti error. And what they teach is error. It's not true. Remember, it was the Muslims that bombed Pan Am Flight 103. It was the Muslims that bombed the World Trade Center in 1993. It was the Muslims that bombed the Marine barracks in Lebanon. They bombed uh, military barracks in Saudi Arabia. They bombed the American Embassy in Africa. They bombed the USS Cole. They bombed the Twin Towers, 9-11. This is a danger. There, there, you cannot be a good Muslim without wanting to kill everybody else who's not a Muslim. That's what the Koran commands. So get out of that religion and accept Jesus Christ as your Savior. Okay, next question. Are there contradictions in the Bible? As a young Christian, I just got saved February 1969, and my parents sent me to the Methodist church camp. I had started going to a little independent temperamental Baptist church and was really getting on fire and radical for the Lord. And they wanted to calm me down a little bit, so I went to this Methodist church camp. And the counselor there set us guys down in the cabin. He said, okay, guys, I'm your counselor for the week. He said, I want you to know I go to Illinois State University. And he said, I'm a humanist. Well, I didn't know what a humanist was, so I said, uh, does that mean you believe in humans? He said, well, I do believe in humans, but no, that's not what that means. I said, well, do you believe the Bible? He said, no. He said, the Bible's a good book, but it contains contradictions. I'd only been saved a couple of months, but my preacher said, if somebody tells you that, you know, hand them your Bible and say, show me one. So I handed him my Bible and said, show me one. He said, I'd be glad to. He said, turn to Genesis chapter 1. Here's what he showed me. I'd been a Christian a couple of months. He said, Genesis 1 tells us on verse 12 that God made the trees, the grass, the plants on the third day. Is that right? I said, yep, that's right. Plants, grass, trees on day three. He said, now look at verse 20. Let the waters bring forth abundantly the moving creature that hath life and fowl that may fly above the earth. He said, Kent, on day five, God made the birds out of the water. Is that correct? I said, yep, that's correct. Remember, he made Adam out of the dirt, and he made Eve out of a rib, he made the birds out of the water. That's what it says, okay? Verse 24, God said, let the earth bring forth the living creature. So the animals are made out of the dirt, birds are made out of the water. And then he made man in verse 26. So he said, Kent, is this right? Trees made on day three, and birds made out of the water on day five, then animals made, and then man was created last. Is that correct? I said, yes, sir, that's correct. He said, now look at chapter two. Genesis chapter two, verse seven. And the Lord God formed man of the dust of the ground, and the Lord God planted a garden eastward in Eden, and there he put the man whom he had formed. And out of the ground made the Lord God to grow every tree. He said, Kent, stop right there, you have a contradiction. Chapter 1 has trees made before man. Chapter 2 has man made and then the trees. He said, look down at verse 18. The Lord God said, it's not good that the man should be alone. I will make him and help meet for him. And out of the ground, the Lord God formed every beast of the field and every fowl of the air and brought them to Adam to see what he would call them. He said, here we have another contradiction. Now, the birds are made out of the ground and they're made after man, not before man. You have two contradictions here. Here are the supposed contradictions. Chapter 1 has plants, grass, trees made on day 3. Chapter 2 has plants, grass, trees made on day 6. Chapter 1 has birds made out of the water on day 5. Chapter 2 has birds made out of the ground on day 6. 
Chapter 1 has animals made before man. Chapter 2 has animals made after man. He said, Kent, the Bible's a good book. I'm glad you like it, but it has contradictions. I was a brand new Christian. I did not know how to answer him, and I felt I just lost this argument. <clears throat> I don't know if you've ever been there before, but I thought, man, I, 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 I lost. <laughs> okay, I'm done. I was frustrated. I was ready to give up on Christianity. I wish I could find that guy now. If you get this tape, listen to this. There's no contradiction there. Here's the sequence of events. On day three, God made the plants. On day five, he made the birds out of the water. On day six, he made the animals. And then he made man. And then he put man in the garden. And now all of chapter two is describing what happened in the garden. Not describing the whole world, just in the garden. In the garden, he made trees that are good for food only, not all the trees, just the ones good for food. The Bible says that specifically in chapter 2. He made one more of each animal so Adam could name them and select a wife. So Adam is in the garden. He's standing there, and God makes the trees grow. And then he makes one more of each animal, and Adam says, Hippopotamus, no thanks. Giraffe, no thanks. Elephant, no thanks. One by one, God made another animal. Adam named him and said, I don't want to marry it. And then God said, Adam, you go to sleep, son. I got a surprise for you and you wake up. And he put Adam to sleep, took out his rib and made Eve. So it is not a contradiction. Chapter 2 is describing what happened in the garden, only, and it's all on day 6. There are no contradictions in Scripture. I remember as a young Christian, I was majoring in math and science and ended up teaching math and science for 15 years. I came across 2 Chronicles chapter 4. It said, Solomon made a molten sea, a big brass bowl, 10 cubits from brim to brim round in compass, and five cubits the height thereof, and a line of 30 cubits did compass it about. I read that verse and said, hold on a minute, we've got a contradiction here. A cubit is elbow to fingertip. And it says this thing was 10 cubits across and 30 cubits around. Well, hey, I was going to teach math. I knew certainly, you know, you take pi times the diameter, and pi is 3.14159265. You know, some Japanese guy figured it to 700 decimal places. I don't know why they do that, but... It's not just three. So it should not have been 30 cubits around. It should have been 31.41 cubits around. So I said, I set my Bible down on my bed. And I said, Lord, if there's a contradiction here, I quit. Here I am, a new Christian, public high school. The kids are making fun of me. I'm getting persecuted. Your book better be right. I'm quitting if it's not. It just bothered me. Maybe it doesn't bother you about the value of pi, but it bothered me. I read the story over and over, and finally it jumped out at me. It's, it's, verse 5 says it was the thickness of it was a hand breadth. This thick. That's a lot of breaths. I thought, wait a minute. I wonder how a hand breadth compares to a cubit. So I went around and did a survey of a bunch of folks. I said, excuse me, can I measure your cubit? You know, put your elbow on the table and measure their cubit and measure their hand breadth. And I found out if you take two hand breadths away from 10 cubits, you can calculate pi to 3.14159. It could be that they were measuring the diameter of this bowl, the outside dimensions, including the thickness of the brass, and the circumference was around the inside. That's one theory. It certainly works fine. The second theory is that it had a lip on it, and it was 10 cubits around the, to the outside diameter of the lip, but 30 cubits around the basic part of the bowl. Either one of those would solve the problem. It's not a problem. There's no contradictions in the Bible. Some people say, what about in... Uh, First Kings, it says Solomon had a molten sea that held 2,000 baths. It's about eight gallons each for a bath. And yet Second Chronicles says it held 3,000 baths. Well, just because it could hold 3,000 doesn't mean it always did. First Kings says, this, says it contained 2,000 baths. But First, Second Chronicles says it received and held 3,000 baths. They probably filled it up and emptied it many times, okay? The capable of holding 3,000, they normally put 2,000 in. It's not a contradiction. It held 3,000 baths, but it contained 2,000 baths, either one. All right, let's cover a few more contradictions after a short break. Okay, let's talk about a few more of the supposed contradictions in the Bible, and then uh, get into a few more questions that frequently come up in our seminars. Some people say there's a contradiction in the book of uh, 1 Kings compared to 2 Chronicles. In 1 Kings chapter uh, 4, it says Solomon had 40,000 stalls of horses for his chariots and 12,000 horsemen. When you read the same parallel passage in 2 Chronicles 9, it says Solomon had 4,000 stalls for horses and chariots and 12,000 horsemen. 
And people say, see, there's a contradiction. Was it 40,000 or 4,000? Even Henry Morris, whom I love dearly and highly respect his work, and we sell his Bible called the Defender's Bible, and I recommend it, but we put a disclaimer with it because he says right here at the bottom of these verses that there is a apparent contradiction because there's a copyist error. He says the people that were copying the scriptures made an error and they should have, they missed a zero. Now, I love Henry Morris and ICR and all their work and don't want to hurt him, hurt him in any way, but this, he's simply wrong about this one. Um, there's not a copyist error. Both verses are perfectly fine. There's no contradiction. Read it very carefully. It says, Solomon had 40,000 stalls of horses for his chariots. The Chronicles passage says, Solomon had 4,000 stalls for horses and chariots. They had 10 horses per chariot. If he had 40,000 stalls of horses for the chariots, he would need 4,000 stalls for the chariots and horses. He had four, 10 horses per chariot. The New, American, or the New International Version, NIV, got it wrong. They messed it up. The New American Standard got it right. The New Revised Standard got it wrong. Um, it's different versions have messed it up. It's perfectly fine like it is. How many men did David kill? When you compare Second Samuel with First Chronicles, Second Samuel says, the Syrians fled before Israel and David slew the men of 700 chariots of the Syrians. When you read the passage in First Chronicles, it says, the Syrians fled before Israel and David slew of the Syrians 7,000 men which fought in chariots. And people say, oh, there's a contradiction here. Was it 700 or 7,000? Both passages are perfectly fine. They had 10 men per chariot. They had 10 men and 10 horses because, you know, you, you, you had to have 10 horses in case you get a flat tire. The chariot, the horse is li more likely to get shot than anything else or the biggest creature out there. And so they would have, the chariot's not going to get tired. The men and horses get tired. So they go out, fight for a while, come back, swap men, swap horses, go out and fight again. Not a contradiction at all. So if he slew the men of 700 chariots, he would slay 7,000 men which fought in chariots. It's perfectly fine, just like it is. The NIV got it wrong. They said David killed 700 of their charioteers. And in Chronicles it says David killed 7,000 of their charioteers. This is a clear contradiction. I would not want to defend any version of the Bible in a debate uh, other than the King James. Uh, New Revised Standard got it wrong. Uh, Genesis 10 says, uh, These are the sons of Shem after their families, after their tongues, in their lands, after their nations. So it says in chapter 10, that the earth was divided up into the different nations and languages. When you come to chapter 11, it says, the whole earth was of one language and of one speech. One atheist I debated said, see, there's a contradiction here. Not a contradiction. Chapter 10 describes all the table of nations. Chapter 11 goes back and is giving a recap of everything. It's no different than a newspaper or a news media man saying, you know, 30 people killed in a bus crash in, you know, the Pocono Mountains or something. And then they, they start telling the story and says, the bus was traveling down the highway. You say, wait a minute, I thought the t headline says the people were killed in the crash. Now it's traveling down the highway. Well, they're retelling the story. Uh, duh. That's common in, in journalism or writing of any kind. And chapter 11 is just retelling the story, giving a, a recap of what happened. Okay. Numbers chapter 25 says, those that died in the plague were 20 and 4,000. I did a debate just a few months ago, and uh, one of the professors that I was, the professor I debated, said the Bible's got contradictions, and this is one he brought up. It says, those that died in the plague were 20 and 4,000. When you read the story in 1 Corinthians, it says, and there fell in one day 3 and 20,000. And he said, see, there's a contradiction here. Is it 24,000 or 23,000? No, it's not a contradiction. Read it carefully. Numbers 25 says, those that died in the plague were 24,000. 1 Chronicles tells, 1 Corinthians tells us, those that died in one day were three and 20,000. Well, a thousand died the next day or a few days later. 24,000 died in the plague, but 23,000 died in one day. It's not a contradiction. We could spend hours talking about supposed contradictions in the Bible. There's a great article about, you know, do rabbits chew the cud? And skeptics have said, no, the rabbit doesn't chew the cud, and yet the Bible says it does. Well, the chew the cud phrase means to re-eat that which was eaten. They chew it, swallow it, cough it up again, and chew it again. Many animals do that. Rabbits eat their food, go to the bathroom, and then eat their doo-doo the next day or later. They re-chew the same food. So they do indeed chew the cud. Okay, another supposed contradiction. How much gold did Solomon get from Ophir? Was it 450 or 420? In 1 Kings 9, it says, Solomon made a navy of ships, and they went to Ophir, and they got 420 talents of gold. 
when you read Second Chronicles, it says, Hiram sent him ships, and they went to Ophir and got 450 talents of gold. And the skeptics will say, see, you got two problems here. Was it Hiram's navy or Solomon's navy? And is it 420 or 450? It's not a contradiction at all. It says in 1 Kings, the king had at sea a navy of Tarshish with the navy of Hiram. They both had navies. Okay? And they went to Tarshish and they brought gold and silver and ivory and apes and peacocks. It says there were 3,000 talents of gold, of the gold of Ophir, used in this house. Apparently they went to Ophir many times if they got four or 500 talents at a time. Not a contradiction at all. We could spend hours, we'll put a, produce a whole tape one of these days on supposed contradictions in the Bible. There aren't any contradictions in, in the scripture. Uh, and you can trust God's word. One last one. People say, shouldn't Easter be translated as Passover? King James is the only version of the Bible that calls it Easter in Acts chapter 12 and verse number 4. Every other version says it was Passover. And people say, this is wrong. King James is wrong about this. Well, now hold on a minute. Let's read the passage here. Acts chapter 12, verse 1. About that time, Herod the king stretched forth his hands to vex certain of the church. And he killed James, the brother of John, with the sword. And because he saw that it pleased the Jews, he proceeded further to take Peter also. Then were the days of unleavened bread. And when he had apprehended him and put him in prison... He delivered him to four quaternions of soldiers to keep him, intending after Easter to bring him forth to the people. And this is the phrase everybody gets bent on a shape about. They'll say, this is a contradiction. It shouldn't be Easter. It should be Pascha should be translated Passover. Okay, let's just go back and look at the Passover. Exodus chapter 12. And the Lord spake unto Moses and Aaron in the land of Egypt. This said, this month shall be to you the beginning of months. This is April, by the way. It is the first month of the year to you. Speak ye unto all the congregation of Israel, and say, In the tenth day of this month they shall take to them a lamb, according to the house, a lamb for their house. And verse 6, You shall keep it up until the fourteenth day, and then you kill it, and you put the blood on the two side posts and on the top of your door. And then you eat the flesh that night. So on April 14th, they eat the lamb. And tells all about the Passover here. It's the Lord's Passover, Exodus chapter 12. Verse 14 says, This day shall be unto you a memorial, and you shall keep it a feast. To the Lord, throughout your generations, you shall keep it a feast by an ordinance forever. Seven days shall you eat unleavened bread. Even the first day you shall put away leaven out of the house. And it goes on to describing the whole story here. And it says in verse 18, In the first month, on the fourteenth day of the month, at even, in the evening, you shall eat unleavened bread until the one and twentieth day of the month at even. So the Feast of Unleavened Bread was seven days right after the Passover when they killed and ate the lamb. Numbers 28 tells us the fourteenth day of the first month is the Passover. The fifteenth day is the feast. Seven days shall unleavened bread be eaten. So here's the sequence. The Passover was at night on April 14th, always. The seven days of unleavened bread followed the Passover. The pagan festival of Astar, or Eastar, was always held late in April to commemorate the earth regenerating itself, which is why Playboy uses the rabbit as their symbol, and we have Easter eggs and Easter bunnies. These are all fertility symbols, okay? Easter is a pagan holiday, no question about it. So the feast days are never called Passover anywhere in Scripture. The feast days followed the Passover. The Bible says Peter was arrested during the days of unleavened bread, the Passover was already done. Herod wanted to keep Peter and kill him during his own pagan festival of Easter, which was coming up in a few days. The King James is the only version to get it right. Look at it carefully here. It says, Then were the days of unleavened bread, and Herod wanted to bring him forth after Easter to kill him. So if it says Passover, I'm sorry, it's wrong. It should be Easter, which was the pagan holiday. The guy who invented the word Passover was the guy who ought to decide when it ought to be used. That was William Tyndale. He created the word Passover. He said in Acts 12, 4, it was Easter. This guy created the word Passover. He should know, in the Tyndale version, uses the word Easter. So he didn't, use it, he didn't use Passover in his own translation, even though he's the one who made up the word. He certainly would have known what, how to use it there. Okay, how much did David pay for the uh, land? Was it 600 shekels of gold or 50 shekels of silver? People say there's a contradiction here. If you read 2 Samuel chapter 24, And the king said to Aruna, Nay, but I will surely buy it of thee at a price. Neither will I offer it, neither will I offer burnt offerings unto the Lord my God of that which doth cost me nothing. 
So David bought the threshing floor and the oxen for 50 shekels of silver. Hmm. But when you read First Chronicles, it says David gave to Ornan for the place 600 shekels of gold by weight. Well, was it 50 shekels of silver or 600 shekels of gold? People say there's a contradiction here. Oh, it's not a contradiction. 50 shekels of silver is a pretty small price to pay for a site that was later to become the Temple Mount. He paid 600 shekels of gold for the site, and he paid 50 shekels of silver for the oxen. First Chronicles seemed to indicate the initial discussion was about the property. Then Ornan offered to sell David the oxen also. It says in 2 Samuel, David said, I will buy it of thee at a price. He said, so David bought the threshing floor, that was the 600 shekels of, shekels of silver, and the oxen for 50 shekels of silver. It's not a contradiction. He's continuing on there. Was Jonah swallowed by a fish or a whale? Well, Jonah chapter 1 says the great fish swallowed up Jonah. Jonah chapter 2 says he was in the fish's belly. Matthew 12 says Jonah was three days and three nights in the whale's belly. People say, oh, see, there's a contradiction. Was it a fish or a whale? Not a contradiction at all. A whale is a fish in biblical classification system. If it swims in the water, it's a fish. Just because modern man has decided that whales and dolphins are mammals and therefore are not classified as fish, that doesn't mean it's the same as the biblical classification. It's not a problem at all. Many other supposed contradictions in the Bible. We'll have to do a whole videotape on those someday. Next question. Why to use the King James Version of the Bible? Why not other versions? Well, I've been a Christian since 1969. I was raised in all kinds of different churches, and when after I got saved, my parents started giving me just about every kind of Bible version there was, and I have a collection of quite a few different Bible versions. I'm not afraid of them. But let me give you a quick history of the different Bible versions, and maybe this will put it in perspective. I have slowly, over 30-some years, come to the position of the King James. Now, I don't fight Christians that use other versions. Use whatever you want, okay? But I think if you're really going to be a Bible student, you're going to have to get a King James. Here's the story. The New Testament books were written shortly after the time of Christ. They had to make copies. It takes about 10 months to write out a copy of the Bible. So they had to write out the whole copy of the Bible by hand. They had no Gazette, no printing press, no, you know, Gutenberg hadn't been born yet. So it took a long time to make a copy of the Bible. They make their copies, of, they had either both books and scrolls, both were in, in use all through Scripture. And they make a copy and then they check it very carefully. If they find a mistake, you're going to burn it. So they were very careful to get it right. They had a checking system that was really pretty goof-proof. They made all these copies and they spread out around the world because this was a time of great persecution. Christians are getting persecuted, so they spread out to different countries and they bring their copies of Bibles with them. So you got somebody in India who's copying the Bible and somebody in France who's copying the Bible, and pretty soon these, the copy wears out. Let's just pick a few numbers here. This is a book from the early 1900s. It's a very beautiful book and it's beginning to get worn out. If this book was in active use, if I opened it and closed it and read from it every single day, it would shorten the life of it. If it just simply sits on the shelf, of course, it lasts longer. But a book in active use is going to quickly fall apart, as this one has already begun to fall apart, and it's not in active use, believe me. The scrolls that are in active use are not going to last more than maybe 200 years. Let's be generous here. Let's say, a, let's say a book lasts 200 years if you use it every day. So they use these scrolls or Bibles, and they're copying from it every day. At the end of the day, they roll it up and they put it away. Within 200 years, it's worn out. It's rags, you, you throw it away. But it doesn't matter because by then you have, you know, 50 copies you've made off of this thing, or maybe 100 copies. They've made copy after copy after copy of these scrolls or books. So you have exact copies of the original. The original is junk by now, so you throw it away. It doesn't matter. You take those 50 copies and you begin making copies off of those. And again, a very careful copying process, but after you know a few hundred years, they are junk, so you throw them away. This goes on you know, several generations, and now you're on the fourth or fifth or sixth generation from the original. And now you have thousands of exact copies of the original, which is long gone. It's been thrown away you know, years and years ago. Okay, about the early 1500s, they decided to put the Bible into English. And so Erasmus and Luther and Tyndale and you know, the Geneva Bible and all this was made in the 14, 15, early 1500s and throughout the 1500s, they're making copies of the Bible, they're translating it to English. They gathered around, they went around and gathered up old scrolls that they could find and copies of the Bible, and they found about 5,000 copies of Scripture uh, from countries all over the world. This group of manuscripts became known as the Texas Receptus, the Received Text. They looked at all these scrolls and could find no differences except the spelling of people's names and the spelling of cities, you know, like Peter and Pedro and stuff like that. 
So they made English translations, and finally the King James in 1611 was made from these texts, the, what's called the majority text. Meanwhile, down in Egypt, there was a group of folks called the Alexandrians down in Alexandria, Egypt, which was at that time a major city. A major library was there, which later burned, but a major city in Alexandria, Egypt. There was a cult down there called the Alexandrians. They're sort of like Jehovah's Witnesses. They wanted everybody to think they were Christian, but they believed a lot of strange things. So they made their own version of the Bible. They left out a lot of verses they didn't like. They changed little things here and there. It was a careful counterfeit, but a counterfeit nonetheless. They have this Alexandrian Bible, and some copies were made. And uh, the primary guy in, in this cult was a guy named Origen, who lived about 240 A.D. In uh, 350 A.D., two copies of the Alexandrian Bible were made, and those copies are called the uh, Sinaiticus, because it was found in the Sinai Desert in a monastery, and Vaticanus, because it was found in the Vatican Library in the basement, I believe. Those two copies from 350 A.D. are still around today. You know, 1,600 years old copies of the Scriptures, well, of the Alexandrian Bible. The Latin Vulgate was made from those manuscripts in uh, 380 A.D. It was translated to Latin. Then in uh, 1582, the Catholic Church ordered the translation of the Latin Vulgate into English, and that's where the Douay Confraternity and the Douay Reims version come in. The Douay versions were made from the Latin, which was a good translation, of the wrong manuscript. They're translating the Alexandrian. So they got the bad manuscript, the corrupt, you know, cult manuscript, being translated into English, which became the official Catholic version in use today, the Douay version of the Bible. Two guys named Westcott and Hort came along in 1875, and they took these Alexandrian manuscripts, of which I think about 15 or 17 of them were found, I don't know, and they said, these are old manuscripts, therefore they're better. Well, now hold on a minute. Yes, they're older, but that doesn't mean they're better. They're older because they're worse. The people didn't use them. They didn't wear them out. But they made a modern Greek version of the Bible from this ancient one. They you know, put it on new paper, new ink, and made a new Greek edition in 1875. This was then translated into English, at least the New Testament in Greek. And so the English translations of the Alexandri of the, of the Westcott and Hort text include the Revised Version done in 1881, the American Standard Version done in 1901, the Revised Standard in 1946, and that's the Bible I got saved from, the New World Translation, Jehovah's Witness Bible, made in 1950. The New American Standard Bible, made in 1960. The Good News Bible, the Amplified Bible, the Living Bible, and the NIV. All of those are good translations of the wrong manuscript. So, I don't fault the translators. I think they're probably sincere men, probably intelligent men, but they're translating the wrong book. They need to get the right Bible. The first mention of Alexandria is in Acts chapter 9, when they were disputing with Stephen, arguing with the Christians. And we still got the same thing today with these different versions of the Bible arguing with the, uh, the real Bible. Okay, my Jehovah's Witness Bible on my shelf will probably never get worn out. It doesn't mean it's better, it just means I'm not going to use it. Okay, I have one, I have a Mormon Bible, I'm just I'm not going to use it. So, that's the story. There are more manuscripts of the Bible than any other book ever written in ancient times. Homer's Iliad, for instance, there are only 643 manuscripts known today. By 1946, they discovered 24,000 manuscripts of the Bible. Then when the Dead Sea scroll, Scrolls were found in 1947, they now have 40,000 new manuscripts to work from. So the Dead Sea Scrolls made it up to the total now of 64,000 manuscripts of Scripture. The Isaiah Scroll is a thousand years older than any known manuscript anywhere in the world. And it's, uh, it matches exactly the Texas Receptus, the King James. I recommend you get the book New Age Bible Versions. You can order it from my ministry or go to avpublications.com if this topic interests you about studying different Bible versions. And we could spend hours about that one, but that's enough. Next question. What is God like, anyway? Man is a three-dimensional person. What's God like? Well, a friend of mine came to me one day when I spoke in Mobile, Alabama, and he said, Hey, Brother Hovind, let's go get some ice cream at McDonald's or something after you're done. I said, That'd be great, Brother. We went to McDonald's, we're sitting here at the table, and he took two pieces of paper out, and he wrote on one Mr. Flat, and on the other one he wrote Mrs. Flat. He said, Kent, let me show you something interesting here. He said, You taught geometry, right? I said, Yes, sir. He said, I want you to imagine we got two people here, Mr. Flat and Mrs. Flat, and they live in flatland. They live in a plane, a two-dimensional world. 
They have no concept whatsoever of the third dimension. They're totally flat. I said, okay. I said, now, suppose you, as a three-dimensional person, would like to get them to know you. But they have no concept of you because you live in a third dimension. I said, okay, I got you. He said, now, you can't put a three-dimensional being into two dimensions. It just simply won't work. Mr. Flat actually sees Mrs. Flat as a straight line. He only sees one dimension. He perceives the second dimension. He can walk around and figure out she's a rectangle, but he actually only sees a straight line when he sees her. I said, okay, I got you. He said, now, you and I can see two dimensions. We see the width and the height, but we perceive the depth. You can't really see depth. You can understand depth because you have two eyes looking at this thing, and you get what's called depth perception. I said, I got it. But actually, you could take a photograph of what you're looking at. It would still look the same. You would perceive the depth because of our you know, common experience, but you can't really see depth. I said, I got it. He said, now, suppose you want to introduce yourself to Mr. Flat and Mrs. Flat. So you stick your finger through the table, and Mr. Flat comes over and looks at it and says, oh, I see a circle, the cross-section of your finger. Over here, you stick three fingers through the table, and Mrs. Flat comes and looks at him and says, Oh, honey, I've seen Kent Hovind. He's three circles. Mr. Flat says, No, honey, he's one circle. And they're going to fight for a while and argue, and finally they're going to split the church and start the church of the three circles and the church of the one circles. But the fact is, neither one of them has a clue what I'm like. You simply can't put a three-dimensional being into two dimensions. They're not going to ever get it. Well, if you read Ephesians chapter 3, it says that we may be able to comprehend with all saints what is the length and depth and breadth and height. The length and depth and breadth and height. There's four dimensions. I think there's an awful lot more to God than we can possibly comprehend in our little three-dimensional world. Just like Mr. Flat and Mrs. Flat are not going to get it about a three-dimensional person, I don't think we three-dimensional persons, per persons are ever going to get it to understand God. But when we get to heaven, we shall see Him, we shall be like Him, we shall see Him as He is, then we're going to say, oh, now I understand. And there are these guys going around saying God has ten dimensions. I think that's heresy. God is infinite. He's not limited by anything whatsoever. He is absolutely God. By definition, it would have to be not limited by time, space, or matter. Next question. What about the races? Where do they come from? Well, there's no question there's a lot of different looking people on this planet. Black ones and white ones and yellow ones and tall ones and little ones, etc. But there really aren't any races. There are skin colors. There's only one race. It's called the human race. Would you say these are different races of cows? No, they're just different skin colors. Okay, and I can assure you they all look the same in the meat locker, and they all taste the same on the hamburger, okay? <laughs> they're just different skin colors, that's all. There are four theories of where the races come from. I don't know which is true. I, I suspect I do, but I'll just give the four theories and tell you what I believe. One theory says Adam and Eve are medium brown, and they produced all the races, all the colors in their own children. Could be true. There's an albino, three albino children born to a black couple. It's just an interesting bit of trivia here. The second theory, which I do not believe, it says the Lord put a mark on Cain in Genesis chapter 4, lest any finding him should kill him. And they say Cain became a black person. I don't buy this for one second, but a lot of churches do. The Mormon church teaches that uh, the Negroes are not equal with other races. This is what the Mormon church teaches in their doctrine book here in 1966. They say it's, it's the Lord's doing. It's based on his eternal laws of justice and grows out of a lack of spiritual valiance of those concerned in their first estate. Lack of spiritual valiance. What do they mean here? Well, I had a couple more missionaries knock on my door one time, and they said, uh, Mr. Hovind, we'd like to talk to you about the Lord. I said, that'd be great, fellas. Which Lord would you like to talk about, yours or mine? They said, oh, we serve the same God. I said, no, fellas, I'm sorry. We serve a different God. I said, let me show you here. Does your God have a body like mine? They said, yep, we believe he does. I said, okay, my Bible says God's a spirit, and they that worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth. I said, does your God live on the planet Kolob, K-O-L-O-B? They said, yeah, we believe he does. I said, well, my Bible says God is all places. The eyes of the Lord are everywhere. He's not living on a planet. He's every place at the same time. That's God. I said, does your God have thousands of wives? I said, yeah, we believe he does. I said, does your God have normal physical relations with those wives and produce spirit children up in heaven? They said, yeah, we believe he does. I said, now, does your God produce the spirit in heaven and the human couple on earth only produces the body. Is that what you guys teach? They said, yep, yeah, that's correct. 
I said, now, if the spirit baby in heaven is a valiant spirit baby, if it's a good spirit baby, when it comes to earth, it gets a white-skinned body. But if it's a bad spirit baby, it gets a black-skinned body. Is that what you believe? They said, well, you're not supposed to know that, but yeah, that is what we teach. I said, fellas, I know you got the little tag on that says elder, even though you're 17. Uh, I said, I've been married, now it's been nearly 30 years. I said, I've got three children, grown, got grandchildren. I said, I taught biology and anatomy. I used to raise hamsters. I said, did you know there are two babies born on earth every second, 24 hours a day, seven days a week, nonstop? And your God supplies a spirit for each one. I said, when does he get time to answer your prayers? <laughs> of course, they knocked the dust off their feet, and I was, I, they never came back. I don't know what happened to them. But the Mormon church teaches that the Negroes are a result of a lack of spiritual valiance in the first estate. That is stupid, okay? That's not true. Uh, they say, Cain, Ham, and the whole Negro race were cursed with a black skin, the mark of Cain. Peterson said, if a Mormon apostle, if there's one drop of Negro blood in my children, they have received the, they received the curse. Brigham Young said, shall I tell you the law of God in regard to the African race? If the white man who belongs to the chosen seed mixes his blood with the seed of Cain, the penalty under the law of God is death on the spot. This will always be so. There's a good book you ought to get called The Secret History of the Mormon Church to see what's happened. How many people were killed trying to leave the Mormon Church? Uh, I mean, it was a serious thing in the early days. I don't know if it still is. I would hope not, but it certainly was. Read the book about secret history. Okay, the third theory about the races says that Noah put a curse on Canaan, his grandson, Canaan. Genesis 9 says, Cursed be Canaan, a servant of servant shall he be. Genesis 9, 26, Canaan shall be a servant. Canaan's a servant. Uh, some people think that uh, Canaan became the first black man, and he, the black people are supposed to be servants. I think that's silly, that's dumb, it's not true. But that, those verses were used to justify slavery during the Civil War here in America. That's not where the races came from. Canaan was not the first black man. The fourth, and I think the most reasonable theory, is that the colors, skin colors came as a result of the Tower of Babel. After the flood, God told them to spread out, have lots of kids, and move around the world. Well, they didn't. They disobeyed God. They stayed in one place, and they tried to build this big tower. Genesis 10, 5 says, By these were the isles of the Gentiles divided in their lands, everyone after his tongue, after their families, in their nations. I think what happened at the Tower of Babel, they broke up into languages, and people had to travel off, and you know, those that spoke French went together, and those that spoke German went together, and they ended up, you got to marry into this little group. So you have close inbreeding, and if you marry cousins or you know, sisters or nieces for a few generations, you're going to have a redneck after a while. Very unusual traits will become pronounced. This is what happened to the Habsburg dynasty. They had to marry royalty. Well, pretty soon they started looking really strange. Long nose, you know, weird looking face, great big chins, uh, six fingers, sometimes hemophiliacs. I mean, a lot of serious problems in the Habsburg dynasty. But Genesis 10, 10 32 said, the families of Noah is what created the nations and also the languages. There's a good book by Bill Cooper you can get called After the Flood, which deals with this topic in great detail. One of Noah's sons, uh, Japheth, in Genesis chapter 10, had about 14 kids or grandkids. It's kind of tough to count. If you go through Genesis, you'll see. It's called the Table of Nations. Very interesting story. But uh, Ham had 31, uh, roughly 31 kids or grandkids, and one of those uh, was Canaan. It's only one of his 31 kids and grandkids. The Bible teaches us that Egypt is the land of Ham. It says so in Psalm 105. Egypt is the land of Ham. And in Psalm 106, it says, the wondrous works in the land of Ham, which is Egypt. There's not a whole lot of question among most Bible scholars that Africa is the land of Ham, the Hamites. So Noah's three sons, Shem, Ham, and Japheth, Ham settled this direction down in Africa. And the black people predominantly originated from Africa. The Japhethites, the descendants of Japheth, became the Europeans. They traveled over this way. And the Shemites became the Orientals. They traveled, you know, Chinese, Japanese, etc. Shem had about 29 kids or grandkids. Makes up a total of roughly probably 75 original languages. So I think the original, at the, after the Tower of Babel, broke up into maybe 60, 70, 80, or 100 different language groups. I think it's pretty obvious that probably English, German, and Danish had an original root language that was the same. I think probably they have originated from the same language. This is English, for instance, from 1,500 years ago. Now, I can't read but one word on the page. That's a duh, the first one. So, the English has changed radically in the last 1,500 years, and 
Spanish, Italian, French, and Latin probably had a common root language. Nobody argues about that. Um, I think a lot of the original languages contained the gospel story. For instance, in Chinese, you see the symbol for boat in the upper right-hand corner here is a combination of the symbol for a vessel, eight, and mouse. Eight mouths in one vessel, that's Noah's Ark. So a boat is the symbol for eight mouths in a vessel. The symbol for garden is dust plus breath plus two people in an enclosure, the Garden of Eden, two people made from the dust of the ground. There are some great, great books on the Chinese language and how it contains the gospel story. Uh, another book called God's Promise to the Chinese. You can get either one of these through our ministry here. I think God made everybody of one blood, according to Acts chapter 17. So you're not superior because of the color of your skin. Malachi said, have we not all one father? We all came from Noah, folks, and nobody's superior because of the color of their skin. They've been searching for the Adam and Eve, according to Science Magazine here, you know, Newsweek Magazine. They say, we had a common ancestor, one woman who lived 200,000 years ago, mitochondrial Eve. Then later they did research and said, wow, maybe it was only 6,000 years ago because they found that mitochondria you know, changes quicker than they thought. And then they said, oops, we know that can't be right, so we're going to keep searching. Uh, the fact of the matter is, the, the Bible's right. About 4,400 years ago, we all came from Noah and his descendants. Uh, Noah's three sons, of course, may have been married to sisters or may have been married to somebody other else from before the flood. I'm not sure what the diversity was in the, uh, before the flood back then. Okay, next question. What about cloning? Well, I think cloning is an interesting genetic trick, but it's not, it's not producing anything new. They're taking a DNA code that already exists and transplanting it. And the DNA code is incredibly complex. We cover this on seminar part four, how complex the code is. What happened with the sheep Dolly, they took a four-year-old sheep and they tried to take a cell and take a nucleus out of the cell and put it into a different cell and implant it so it would develop into a new sheep. They had 277 failures. It cost him $50,000 to make that one sheep. And then Dolly ended up aging much faster than normal and died very early. Didn't live near as long as a normal sheep does. So basically, it was a failure. $50,000 for one sheep. I said, fellas, hey, the sheep can do this a whole lot quicker and cheaper. Leave them alone. They're doing fine. Okay. Next question. Why did God make poisonous snakes in a perfect world? I don't know the answer to this one for sure, but I have a theory that might help shed some light on this. Um, Dr. Uh, Guderin in western Ecuador has treated 300 cases of snake bite with electric shock. They use a stun gun. If you get bit by a poisonous snake, if they get you within the first, you know, 30 minutes, they will take a stun gun and shock the site of the injury where you got bit. They shock the other side of the limb. And if it's been more than 30 minutes, they go halfway to the heart and shock you again. The electric shock going through your body neutralizes the poison. A lot of people in jungle areas now are carrying little stun guns, and if you get bit by a poisonous snake or a poisonous spider, you spark it and go back to work. So many theories abound on why there were poisonous snakes. Maybe they weren't poisonous. You can contact Carl Baugh, Glen Rose, Texas, about the hyperbaric chamber he has there, where he raised poisonous snakes, I believe it was copperheads, under hyperbaric conditions, high-pressure oxygen, and increased electromagnetic field, which probably the Earth had before the flood, stronger magnetic field, after two weeks, his snakes were not poisonous. They were still snakes, of course, but the poison was not harmful to the human body. So, a uh, 50 milliamp uh, spark at 60 hertz is safe for medical is a safe medical limit. Many stun guns are 3 milliamp, so it's not a problem at all. They say you should shock the bite as soon as possible. Straddle the bite with the probes and shock twice in an X pattern. If more than 30 minutes has passed, connect a wire to one probe and shock through the limb. This is how they're doing it in uh, missionary schools. They're teaching them how to handle snake bites with uh, stun guns. Or you know, if you can't get that, get a spark plug off of a lawnmower, or a chainsaw, or a car or something, you know, and shock it. It'll help neutralize the poison. All right, what about the Ark of the Covenant? Well, in Jeremiah chapter 52, it tells us that they took away the cups, the spoons, the bowls. I mean, it mentions all kinds of little detail things out of the temple. In Ezra, it tells us about the stuff they brought back. And it says that Nebuchadnezzar brought back stuff to the temple. They brought, or Nebuchadnezzar took away in, uh, the things, and Ezra brought them back here. It mentions the knives, the gold and silver basins, the cups, everything. Little tiny stuff is all mentioned, but the Ark of the Covenant is never mentioned. What happened to the Ark of the Covenant? Well, in 2 Chronicles 26, it tells us Uzziah prepared cunning engines and machines to cast great stones. They made basically catapults. 
He put these on the walls of the city of Jerusalem to fling these massive stones out there to protect the city. Nebuchadnezzar came along and said, I would like to take over your city. I'd like all your gold. I want to kill all of you folks. So they, you know, had a big siege. Nebuchadnezzar apparently built a siege wall outside the range of the catapults. And he's just going to starve them out. In between the regular wall and the siege wall is no man's land. So apparently, Jeremiah, who was in the city, knew they were going to lose. God told him, you're going to lose. Tell the king to surrender. The king didn't want to surrender, so they ended up losing. But uh, Jeremiah took the temple furniture outside the city wall and inside the siege wall, probably at night, and he hid the Ark of the Covenant, the table of showbread, the candlestick. A lot of these things were taken outside the city wall, but inside the siege wall, and hidden in a cave system. If you look at the city of Jerusalem here, and pretend it's a clock, right about 10 o'clock you'll see Golgotha. Right there where Golgotha is, is apparently where this cave system was that Jeremiah hid it. If you read Jeremiah 27, it says, The nation and kingdom that will not serve the same Nebuchadnezzar king of Babylon, that nation will I punish. Jeremiah knew full well they were supposed to surrender to Nebuchadnezzar. King didn't want to do it, and they didn't do it, so they ended up being killed, most of them, taken captive. So, Jeremiah took the temple furniture, apparently, outside the city wall in a cave system, a tunnel system, out to underneath where today is Golgotha, where Jesus was crucified. Ron Wyatt was a good friend of mine. He died in 99, but he did a lot of research over there, and he says that he actually saw the Ark of the Covenant. I get people that criticize me for even mentioning Ron Wyatt. Well, I think he did good work, and you ought to, you ought to re read what he's done, read his research. He says the Ark of the Covenant was there in a box made of like a big stone uh, case, and it was sealed up in a, a room. They you know, found this, it's like a big sponge over there. This cave system is pretty uh, spread out. And he saw the Ark of the Covenant. He said all it had was the Ten Commandments in it, nothing else. I talked to Ron. In 1982, in uh, January 82, Ron's claims he found the ark. I spent several hours talking to Ron. I said, Ron, you realize how, how far-fetched this sounds? He said, Brother Hovind, if you were telling me, I wouldn't believe you. He said, but it happened. I'll tell you. He said, I brought the Jewish authorities. I told them what I found. They haven't touched it. They're afraid to touch it. They learned from a guy named Uzzah years ago in First Chronicles when Uzzah touched the ark and God killed him. So they haven't touched it, but they do know it's there, and they're going to bring it out as soon as they're ready. Uh, you can talk, see the WyattMuseum.com website if you want to get more on the Ark of the Covenant. Next question. What about Bigfoot? Well, I have talked to 10 people now who've told me face to face they have seen a Bigfoot. Todd Jurassic, friend of mine from Oklahoma, has done incredible research on Bigfoot. You can get a hold of Todd. He's writing a book about the creature. Uh, he's interviewed many folks who claim they've seen one. It appears that the Patterson film may be a fake. I don't know. They said somebody confessed that you know they were dressed up in an ape suit and all that stuff. I don't know. But there have been an awful lot of sightings that are pretty hard to explain that appear to be something like a Bigfoot. I don't know what it is, but here are the theories. Some people say they're all hoaxes or misidentified. That certainly could be true. I don't know. There are many stories that simply can't be explained, I don't think, as hoaxes or misidentified. There seem to be pretty reliable sightings with hard to explain things like deep footprints that a person couldn't make unless he weighed 600 pounds. By the way, who in their right mind would run around the woods in an ape suit? Do you realize how many rednecks would love to shoot one of those things and bring it and hang it on their wall? <laughs> I mean, that's just not smart, okay? I don't think they're all just uh, hoaxes or frauds, though some probably are. Second theory says they're an unidentified species of ape. Third theory says they're some of the hippies from the 60s that haven't come in yet. They're hairy and they stink. Um, fourth theory says they're aliens from another world. I doubt that one. So, bottom line is I don't know who they are. There may not even be any, but if there's a Bigfoot, I think it'd be interesting to find one and put it in my museum. We'd, we'd take good care of it, you know, feed it and all that stuff. Next question. Who were the Nephilim in Genesis chapter 6? Genesis 6 says, Men began to multiply in the face of the earth, and daughters were born unto them. And the sons of God, mentioned 11 times in the Bible, saw the daughters of men, that they were fair, and they took them wives of all which they chose. And then it says, God said, My spirit will not always strive with man. His day shall be 120 years. Some people think that 120 is until the flood comes. Some people think nobody's going to live past 120. That can't be true because after this was given, many people live past 120. Uh, Shem lived past, he lived to 600. So I don't think this is talking about lifespans. I think it's talking about, you know, until the flood comes, you've got 120 years warning. Okay. Verse 4, though, says, There were giants in the earth in those days, and also after that. 
When the sons of God came into the daughters of men, they bare children to them. The same became men of renown, men of old, men of which were of renown. I think maybe the phrase and after that might separate this into two totally unrelated thoughts. I don't know, but this, the men of renown may not be the giants. It may be totally unrelated. But it's the only verses on the topic. There's just not much to go on. Apparently God doesn't want us to know about all this, or doesn't want us to dwell on this for some reason. But it says in verse 5, God saw the wickedness of man. It was great in the earth, and his evil his thoughts were evil continually. There are several theories about what this passage means. One theory says the sons of God were fallen angels that followed Satan. That's a very reasonable theory, and I think probably the correct one. But the problems with that are angels don't marry. But those passages say angels don't marry in heaven. Maybe they were allowed to marry on earth. I don't know. Of course, this idea that the third of the angels followed Satan comes from the Revelation 12 passage, where it says a third of the stars were drawn down by his tail. That's in Revelation. I don't know how this could apply to the creation, you know, 6,000 years earlier, but... It may indeed be that a, thousand of, or a third of the angels followed Lucifer in his rebellion. It seems to be the best answer anybody's come up with. Second theory says, the sons of God are the line of Seth marrying the line of Cain. I don't believe this one for a second, but a lot of people do. The reason being, uh, ungodly people marry godly people all the time. That doesn't produce you know, giant children or anything, uh, anything physical anomaly. I think it's unwise for Christians to marry non-Christians, but it certainly doesn't produce children that are you know, deformed or something like that. Not physically, anyway. And there's no evidence that Seth's line were godly. I mean, they drowned in the flood, too. So people say Seth's line was godly and Cain's was ungodly. Everybody was ungodly. You know, read the scripture. There's a good uh, tape series about the Nephilim by Chuck Missler from 1-800-K-House-1 or his website, khouse.org. Get Chuck Missler's uh, article about the return of the Nephilim. I suspect, though, that before the flood came, these people, if it's demons marrying angel, or demons marrying daughters of men, Probably that's true. And they're producing some kind of, you know, half demon, half human children. And they were unusual, unusual physical traits, you know, able to fly, maybe you're a giant people or super strong or something. Whatever happened, they all drowned in the flood. And probably Noah's kids, after the flood, would tell the stories to their kids about the guy that used to live down the street. And they'd tell their kids, you know, hey, you should see the guy that lived down the street from us before the flood came. He had wings on his feet and could fly or something. And this developed into the uh, Greek and Babylonian legends of the gods and Zeus and Olympus and Mercury and Thor and all this kind of stuff. That's just one theory. Okay. Next question. What about UFOs? Don't know. There are several theories about UFOs. Um, I'll give you a couple books so you can read about that. I don't have an answer to the question. New Leaf Press has a good book called uh, UFO End Time Delusion by uh, David Allen Lewis. It's a shortened version of the same book, a Reader's Digest version. UFO 666, uh, Alien Encounters by Chuck Missler, again, covers a lot on UFOs. The Cosmic Conspiracy by Stan Dale is a good one for UFOs. Basically, UFO sightings may fit into the following categories. They might be just simply misidentified natural objects like weather balloons, swamp gas, etc. They could be top secret or private experiments. There's popular mechanics from November 2000 showing an experiment with the U.S. government planning to build a, what would sure look like a UFO to somebody if they saw it. It may be satan satanic or demonic. Satan can only be one place at a time. God is all places at all times. And most of the authors I shared with you earlier fall into the category of saying that there are two kinds of UFOs, top secret government stuff and demonic. Best I can do on that one. Next question. How long were they in the Garden of Eden before they sinned? Well, the Bible says Adam lived 130 years and had a son named Seth. Of course, now before that, they had Cain and Abel, but no dates are given. They could have been in the garden for a hundred years before they sinned. I don't, we know on day seven, God looked at everything and it was very good. Satan hadn't fallen yet. Adam hadn't sinned yet after the first week. We cover more on this on videotape number two. But uh, probably they were in the garden maybe a hundred years. Certainly not. Uh, uh, certainly Satan didn't fall before that. And the Bible says God drove him out after they sinned, out of the Garden of Eden, put the flaming sword there and the cherubims and all that stuff. And Eve is the mother of all living. So there are no other life forms on this planet. Next question. People say, Didn't, aren't created and made different words, you know? Uh, well, they're used interchangeably all through Scripture. Here's a list here, and we'll have these on our website, about how made, the heavens and earth are made, the heavens and earth are created. The firmament was made in Genesis 1, but it was created in Psalm 148. There are many Scriptures that show, how, Genesis 2, 4, for instance. These are the generations of the heaven and the earth when they were created in the day that the Lord God made the earth and the heavens. Here the words are clearly used interchangeably. 
Bible says he made the heavens, he made the trees, he created the trees, he made the animals, he created the animals. He made animals on land and he created animals on land. He made man, he created man. I mean, there are dozens of verses for this. So no, the words are not different. It's just a matter of saying the same thing in two different ways. We do the same thing in English. We'll say the guy was huge, he was big, he was gigantic. We do it for emphasis. Uh, it says he created the O Jacob and formed the O Israel. So words created and made are used interchangeably all through Scripture. Don't let somebody tell you that this is proof for the gap theory or something else, because it is not. Another question. People say, where can I get more information on creation? Well, there are many good sources. We have a lot of links on our webpage, drdino.com. We offer four college courses through our ministry, uh, CSE 101, 102, 103, and 104. In those courses, we have taken our seminar, and I didn't skip a thing. We just chased every rabbit and kicked every dog and went through everything we could find on creation evolution. It turned out to be 60 hours of teaching on the subject. You're welcome to get that. Uh, Landmark Freedom Baptist Curriculum is really good if you want stuff on creation for school ministries. Uh, many people produce curriculum on uh, creation, and we'll be glad to steer you to some of those. We link a lot of these on our website, drdino.com. Next question. People say, do you really have a Ph.D.? Boy, I get, you'd be amazed how many folks in debates say, oh, you don't have a real Ph.D. Well, I think you have the right to face your accusers, obviously. If somebody's saying, I don't have a Ph.D., then I want you to, you know, come face me face to face and let's talk about it, okay? Give me a chance to defend myself. I'm always ready to answer questions, and no questions are, I'm not afraid of anything. I'm not hiding a thing. But when somebody starts asking, you know, criticizing somebody's degree or the person personally, it's pretty obvious they're losing the argument on the merit of the arguments, and they're trying to find, shoot the messenger instead of deal with the message. So, Ph.D. in the dictionary is Doctor of Philosophy. That's all it means a doctor of philosophy. Here's a photograph or a picture of my Ph.D. from Patriot University in Colorado. Patriot University was part of Hilltop Baptist Church for many years. That's where they were when I got my degree from there. Then they have now become independent and they moved out to uh, Alamosa, Colorado, about 60, 50, 40, 50 miles away from Colorado Springs. They are an independent um, Baptist church that started a seminary to help people get degrees that uh, were still in full-time Christian service, which was me. It took me nine years to finish mine. I worked very hard for mine. I don't know if people work for theirs or not, but I worked hard for mine. And I got a Ph.D. If you don't like it, then call me Bubba or Kent or Hey You, and let's get back to the topic. Okay, You don't have to call me doctor if you don't like it. Um, Patriot University was established in 18, uh, 1980. It's an extension of Hilltop Baptist Church, I, and it offered a Ph.D. in education. I spent many years working for my degree, and I learned a lot, and I got a Ph.D. in 1991. They then moved to College Heights Baptist Church in Alamosa, Colorado, where it continues to operate today. Um, some people uh, put a picture of the church parsonage on, the web, on their website and said, this is where Hoven got his Ph.D. Well, the church parsonage has the same address as the church. And how that applies to me, I don't know. I mean, it was a Hilltop Baptist when I got mine, and now it's in Alamosa. This really shows they're desperate and dumb, in my opinion. Um, some people have ridiculed the size of the school. Well, there's about three PhDs per year and about 25 graduates a year out of Patriot University. It's a small Christian college, no question. Um, it'd be interesting if you could see the look on these guys' faces if they knew the size of the school that many of our early presidents or congressmen or military leaders graduated from. Uh, if Harvard offers a PhD degree program and only has three students in it, which is often the case, by the way, in many schools, one or two students many times in a, in a PhD program, what does that mean? I mean, they're not accredited. I mean, they're no good because they've only got one student or two students. I mean, come on. Use your head. doesn't mean a thing. They say, is it a diploma mill? You know, they're just cranking out these diplomas and selling them. You can buy it for 100 bucks. Well, that's not the case at all, okay? I worked hard for mine. If you don't like it, don't call me that. Don't do whatever you want. Patriot has 25 graduates uh, each year. Three to five are getting doctorate degrees. My 30-year study on creation led me to start this ministry. Uh, full-time, 1981. Started in 1989, but full-time, 91. I speak a little over 800 times a year now on this subject. I've had over 80 debates. I've been a guest on 5,000 radio, TV, call, and talk shows. My itinerary is available on my website. If any evolutionist is inter interested in a public debate, they're welcome to contact me to arrange a time when I'm in their area and I'll have a debate in a public place like a university. Uh, if they don't think I have a doctor's degree, then call me Bubba and let's just discuss the topic of creation. So, we've been offering a quarter million dollars for those that have real evidence for evolution and I think it's one of the dumbest theories in the history of the world. Darwin's only degree was in theology, but he's called a scientist in the textbooks. That's interesting. 
who determines who a scientist is anyway? Who's making this call? You know, a person who studies science is a scientist. Why don't they call him Reverend Darwin? That was his degree. Dr. Morris pointed out, it's worth noting that almost none of the leaders of this evolutionary revival have been trained as scientists in the modern sense. None were educated as physicians, as physicists or chemists or biologists or geologists or astronomers or other natural scientists. Charles Darwin was an apostate divinity student whose only degree was in theology. Charles Lyell was a lawyer. William Smith was a surveyor. Uh, James Hutton was an agriculturist, John Playfair a mathematician, Robert Chambers a journalist, Alfred Wallace had little education at all, and a brief apprenticeship in surveying. Thomas Huxley had a very indifferent education in medicine. Spencer received practically no formal education, except in railroad engineering. Thomas Malthus was a theologian and economist. Erasmus Darwin was a medical doctor and a poet. And yet all of these guys are the founders of the evolution theory. Only Jean-Baptiste Lamarck in France and Ernst Haeckel in Germany seem to have a bona fide education in a branch of science, and they all had their particular anti-Christian agenda. Haeckel and uh, Lamarck were wildly wrong, and they used simple lies to promote the evolution theory. So, summary. I earned a Ph.D. from a non-accredited Christian university. Thousands of major world leaders throughout history had no degrees of any kind. Thousands of major universities today offer distance learning, uh, website learning, internet site. You don't have to go to the school to get your degree. In many cases, there's nothing wrong with that. Thousands of people who attend classes in universities cheat, lie, or bribe their way to get a degree. Getting a degree from an accredited university does not guarantee any level of intelligence or accuracy of beliefs. Science has a long history of teaching things that are wrong. If you don't like my degree, call me Kent, and let's get back to the topic. So, if I was dumb and desperate, I would start attacking the person's degree instead of attacking the subject, which is exactly what's going on. Help them to grow up, get a life, and let's get back to the topic. Next question. People ask me, what about the Red Sea crossing? I mean, if a whole army crossed the Red Sea, there ought to be some evidence of this. Wouldn't you find evidence for the Bible being true? Well, in Exodus 14, it says they're going to encamp by the sea where God commanded them to. Exodus 14 tells us that when they went across, the waters, they went on dry ground, and the water was a wall on the right hand and on the left hand. So they're not wading across shallow water. There actually is actually a miracle. They're down in the sea with the water as a wall on both sides. Interesting. It says, God took off the chariot wheels of the Egyptians. That's what the Bible says in Exodus 14. And the waters returned and covered the chariots and the horsemen. All right. Well, if you look at the country of Egypt, to the right side is the Red Sea. It has two branches to it. The left branch is the Gulf of Suez. The right branch is the Gulf of Aqaba. In between is what is often called the Sinai Peninsula. A Phoenician, pharaoh, a Phoenician princess pointed at a mountain one day and said, I think that's Mount Sinai. She had no clue where Mount Sinai was, but she said that's Mount Sinai. Everybody calls it Mount Sinai even today, but it's not Mount Sinai. It can't be as we'll see in a minute. Apparently, the children of Israel followed this red line out of Egypt all the way across what is now called the Sinai Peninsula and crossed over at the Gulf of Aqaba. I got this information from Ron Wyatt and Richard Reeves, who spent years over there researching this. Um, there's a dry riverbed where that red line is that flows right up and ends up at the Gulf of Aqaba. Here you see it, the Gulf of Aqaba in the distance there, and there's actually a, a pathway between the mountains, very rugged terrain. It ends up on this beach right there where the arrow's pointing. This is a satellite view, kind of from the north. And that, that is actually a giant beach, able to hold several million people. No way to flee north or south, because you're, once you get out there, you are flat stuck. Okay, There's mountains all around, a little valley that you just came through, and no place to get out. Apparently, the children of Israel got trapped there with Pharaoh's army closing in the gap behind them. At the south end of this beach, many years ago, Ron and his sons found a pillar and they dragged it out and scrubbed it off, and they could only read a few words on it, mostly pretty eroded, but they found another pillar just like it on the other side in Arabia, in Saudi Arabia, and the pillar said this was erected by King Solomon to commemorate the crossing of the Red Sea. Hmm. The maps of the depth of the water there are interesting. There's called the Elat Deep. I went uh, swimming in, uh, and went down to visit uh, Elat, uh, Israel, where it comes down and touches the, the Red Sea here. Um, it's about 5,000 feet deep in here, in the, in the Gulf of Aqaba, except for this one spot where it's only 900 feet deep. There's a natural underwater land bridge. It's about eight miles wide and only 900 feet deep. 
A um, friend of mine, Aaron, went over there and said, look, folks, this is absolutely correct. Uh, the bath Israeli bathymetric chart uh, says this is only 900 feet deep here. And some people are criticizing Ron Wyatt, saying it's not true. There's not a bridge there. Yes, there is an underwater land bridge. So Ron and his sons went out there scuba diving out as deep as they could go, 150 feet or so, and found chariot wheels with no chariots attached and chariots with no wheels attached. They found rib cages of humans, rib cages and hooves of animals that are... Uh, Fossilized, not fossilized, but covered with coral. You can go to the museum in Cornersville, Tennessee, south of Nashville, about 50 miles, and I think it's exit 27, and there's a converted gas station right there, which is the Wyatt Museum, and see these things for yourself. See that the horse hoof all dried up and uh, dehydrated. The 18th uh, dynasty in Egypt is the only one to use the eight spoke, six spoke, and four spoke chariot wheels, and all of those are found at the bottom. On the right side over here, you see a mountain called Jabal al Laws, which means Mountain of Laws. And that is Mount Sinai. The Bible says in Galatians 4, Sinai is in Arabia. Why are they looking for it in the Sinai Peninsula? It's not even there. It can't be. Apparently, this is Mount Sinai. Um, black on top. Whether that's from the burning or not, I don't know. But it could be that it actually burned and melted the rocks on top. At the bottom of this mountain, there's a, a bunch of rocks. with a, This one has a calf drawn on it. They think probably this is the altar they built with the calf. Exodus 20, God told them to smite the rock and water would come out for the people to drink. Most Bible pictures uh, show a little stream of water coming out. They had several million people plus their animals. They're not going to feed them with a stream of water like that. It's not going to work. It had to be water gushing out of there. It actually had to be a river. There's this big boulder you can see here in the background. This is a, as big as a five-story building. It is split right in half, completely in half. And on both sides, there are erosion marks. This may be the rock that Moses smote, and the water came gushing out of both sides. A river flowed out and watered everybody. Okay, people say, what about Sodom and Gomorrah? Where's that at? Well, the Lord said in Genesis 19, he would rain upon Sodom and Gomorrah brimstone. Brimstone is burning sulfur. If you look at this map of the Dead Sea, you can see there are five spots. Zeboam, Adma, Gomorrah, Zo Sodom, and Zoar. These apparently are where the cities were, of those five cities that were burned. Uh, when I was on top of Masada in uh, March of 2002, I went over to Israel. You can look down from the top of Masada and see a square, which is apparently where Sodom was. The city's all burned. You don't even tell it's a city until you get uh, very far away from it. It's mentioned in Deuteronomy chapter 29, and mentioned in Genesis chapter 14, about the kings of Sodom and Gomorrah, Adma, Zeboam, and these guys got in trouble and, you know, basically uh, the Lord had to judge their cities here. So apparently those are the five cities that burned. If you go to get up real close to this thing, you'll realize, actually, if you look at the walls, those look like just ash cliffs, but the closer you get, the more you realize, man, that's, that's a city that was burned. And the bricks have actually turned to ash. Peppered in that ash, there are thousands, actually millions of sulfur balls. I've got some right here on the table. These are actually pieces of 99% sulfur. The outside is kind of a white color, but if you break it open, it's a little more yellow inside. It kind of, apparently it burned itself out. Golf ball size, variety of size. It literally rained sulfur on that city. In the ash, which is apparently burned brick, there are little indentations where the sulfur balls are. The one fell out of here. There's one piece of one over here. This is a piece of ash from that area. And many folks, including myself, think this is the actual Sodom and Gomorrah, and we have the physical evidence for it. It literally burned the cities to ash. This may be what's called a, a, a ziggurat or something to guard the uh, opening at the city. And Ron Wyatt and Richard Reeves spent a lot of time over there and are very convinced, as am I, that this is Sodom and Gomorrah. Next question. People say, don't wisdom teeth prove evolution? <laughs> no. It is true that about 60% of the population has trouble with their wisdom teeth. They have to get them removed, or they become infected or impacted or something like that because their jaw is not big enough to grow in. The fact of the matter is this is not evidence for evolution. This is evidence man used to be bigger and live longer and develop more slowly in the past. If before the flood people lived to be 900 and they develop slowly and you're a kid till you're 40 and you're a teenager till you're 60 and you get married when you're 80, um, life was just slower and more relaxed. They would be bigger. By the time you're 20, it's time for that last tooth to come in to fill in your jaw, which is still growing. Jack Kowazo, the dentist from New Jersey, has an excellent book dealing with this topic a little bit. It's called Buried Alive. 
uh, showing how that the human face never stops growing and people living to be two to three hundred would need this wisdom tooth because they would be so much bigger. So the Neanderthals actually used their wisdom teeth. They show signs of wear on them. The Neander Neanderthals probably were people living to be 200 years old. Get the book Buried Alive if you want more on that. Next question. People say, Brother Hovind, in your seminar and in your debate, sometimes you're sarcastic with the atheists. I know, and I'm sorry. Okay, that's just a personality quirk, I guess. I'm working on it. But in my over 30 years of ministry, I've seen thousands of lives changed by the teachings on creation, including many scoffers who've come to Christ. I'm not trying to drive them off. I'm trying to bring them to the Lord. Trust me on this one. But the uh, Bible says, Beware, lest any man spoil you with your philosophy and vain deceit. I get a little upset, I guess, when I see these people with their evil philosophy spoiling children that come through their class. So professors that teach evolution, I just don't have a lot of uh, patience with them. I'm sorry, okay? I think if I was going to rescue some people who were being killed by Hitler's guards, I would have a hard time being nice to the guards, okay? I'd want to kill the guards and rescue the people. So it's not that you're mad at them necessarily, you know, you, but you're mad at what they're doing, okay? And I'm mad at what the professors are doing. The Bible says, if you smite the scorner, the simple will beware. So I guess I'm a little hard on the atheists because their philosophy is destroying others and you have to stop them, okay, somehow. And if you really give them a hard time intellectually and prove that they're wrong, make a fool of them, other people are going to listen and say, oh, wow, I better not, you know, believe in evolution. So it's kind of a tactic to help do that. The Bible says, when the scorner is punished, the simple is made wise, Proverbs chapter 21. The Bible says, cast out the scorner and contention shall go out. So, if you look at the way they did in the Bible, you'll see in the book of 1 Kings, uh, they, uh, Elijah made fun of the prophets of Baal. They were crying, oh, Baal, hear us, you know, come on, Baal, light my fire. And Elijah mocked him. He said, cry aloud, he's a god, he's talking or he's pursuing or he's in a journey, he's sleeping, maybe he must be awakened. So he mocked the false prophets. Jesus called the scribes and Pharisees hypocrites, whited sepulchers, full of dead men's bones. He said, O generation of vipers, who hath warned you to flee from the wrath to come? How can ye, being evil, speak good things? He called them evil. He called them snakes and vipers and whited sepulchers. Uh, he, all you got to do is read through Scripture. Jesus said Herod was a fox. He said, Go tell that fox, you know, that I'm going to cast out devils. If he doesn't like it, that's basically tough. He said, Ye stiff-necked and uncircumcised in heart, O full of all subtlety and all mischief, thou child of the devil, thou enemy of all righteousness, wilt thou cease, not cease to pervert the right ways of God, of the Lord? Boy, you can tell him he perverts things. All throughout Scripture, the Bible calls people fools, brutish, simple, perverse, scorners, wicked. I'm just trying to be like my Heavenly Father. So that's why I use scar sarcasm with the scoffers. People often ask me the question, Brother Hovind, why don't you answer all the scoffers on the anti-Hovind websites? There are now over 500 anti-Hovind websites, people that absolutely hate me. One guy said, Dr. Hovind, do you realize you're the most hated man in our chat room? I can't believe how many people out there talk about you. Apparently, you have struck a nerve. Keep up the great work. That was an email I got. Well, here's some things to consider about my answer to this one. Number one, I will gladly answer any questions about my seminar or anything I believe. I do this, I have live question and answer sessions just every single week when I go out and speak. I have these question and answer sessions everywhere. I've been in 49 states and 30 countries. I take all the questions that time permits, off until midnight. We'll stay and answer questions. Number three, I have a long-standing offer to debate anybody on creation evolution. I debate any number of evolutionists. If there's 10 of them and one of me, that's perfectly fine. 10 against one is not a problem if I get half the time. And we talk about one topic at a time. I will pay a, a professor, who, not a, some high school kid, but I'll pay a college professor 100 bucks if he'll debate me and a quarter million if they can prove evolution. I've had over 3,000 people refuse to debate so far. They were start, just started recently putting a list on our website of some other professors who refused to debate me. I speak about 800 times a year now. I answer many thousands of calls and letters and emails. There are many millions who want to hear. So why waste time on those who don't want to hear? If I wasted hours answering all their silly questions, which most are already answered in my seminar, they would only ask more questions to try to tie up my time. They're trying to waste my time is what they're trying to do. The Bible says, Give not that which is holy unto dogs, neither cast ye your pearls before swine. So I simply don't have time to answer the skeptics on the website. If I was going to plant a garden to feed my family, and half my yard was good soil and half was hard rock, I would plant the good soil first. Make sure I get a crop started. If I got time, I'll go work on the rock. If I don't have time, oh well, okay? I guess I feel that way. I've only got 24 hours in a day, and I'm gonna use, I'm gonna invest my time and energy where it might produce some fruit. 
You could spend hours and hours talking to an atheist on the internet and waste, and waste a lot of time. If he doesn't want to hear, you're wasting your time, okay? Some are very sincere, open, and, you know, they really are seeking. Well, go for them. But you've got to decide, you know, if you want to, what you want to put your time into. Where's going to bear the most fruit? And I, want, I talk to those who want to hear. Skeptics are always welcome to call me. But if they email me and try to get me into an email debate, I simply won't do it. I'm sorry, I don't have time. That's my reason for not doing that. So, hope this has been helpful. We have uh, all sorts of questions answered um, even more on our Creation Science 104 uh, Science College class, if you want to get that one. We offer many materials through our ministry, lots of uh, debates on videotape, lots of other materials on homeschooling. We, we want to be a blessing.